Good morning and welcome to the first annual De Silva Center for Epstein's Anomaly brought to you by UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. My name is James Ferris and I am functioning as the technical support for today's meeting. If you have used Zoom before, you may have noticed today's webinar is a slightly different format. Only today's presenters are able to share their screens and webcam. If you have questions during a presentation, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it there. The presenters will answer all questions at the conclusion of each segment. If you have technical problems during today's webinar, you can send me a message via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for attending today's conference. Good morning. My name is Victor Morell. I'm the Chief of Pediatric Cardiac Surgery at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC. And I wanna welcome you all to our first annual Da Silva Center for Epstein's Anomaly Symposium. This is a long time coming. Uh, Jose Pedro Da Silva and Luciana have been here for about five years. Uh, we've been uh, talking over these years about establishing a yearly symposium in which we can uh, share uh, our experiences with the comb procedure and the management of Epstein's Anomaly with all of you. I am extremely happy to say that we have over 400 participants from over 40 countries, pretty much every continent is represented. We are uh, very excited, and I hope that this morning proves to be very educational for everybody. Uh, I'm gonna now introduce uh, Dr. Jackie Kurtzer, who's the Chief of Pediatric Cardiology here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, who will go over again some of the housekeeping issues and introduce our first presenter. Good morning. Thank you very much, Victor, and thanks so much for all the attendees from all over the world. Uh, welcome. Um, and I wanted to, you know, this is a special moment um, for us all together trying to elucidate specifics of this fascinating disease, Epstein's anomaly. I'm grateful to UPMC and for the support and to Congenital Heart uh, Academy for streaming uh, our webinar and for all the speakers and participants. I'm going to um, present uh, today, we have uh, as a, uh, the guest uh, honor in this uh, conference as faculty, Professor Bob Anderson. As you know, renowned uh, pathologist, cardiac morphologist, very, very well known to all of us. And uh, I wanted to welcome him and he will start uh, our first uh, presentation on embryology and anatomy uh, of Epstein's anomaly. Well, good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Anderson. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And indeed, it's a pleasure to be joining you again in Pittsburgh. I have strong connections with Pittsburgh. I've been coming through Children's Hospital now since 1979. So what I've been asked to talk to you again today is Ebstein's malformation, specifically the development and the anatomy. But it's appropriate if I start by telling you just a few things about Wilhelm Epstein. As you can see, he was born in 1836 in Prussia. And at that time, Prussia also owned East Prussia. And he went to university initially in Breslau, which is now in Poland. He continued his studies in Berlin but he returned to Breslau to start his career as a physician. He wasn't there long because he made great strides and already by 1874, he was sufficiently well recognized to be appointed as the professor of medicine at Göttingen, perhaps the leading medical university in Germany. And he stayed in Göttingen for the remainder of his career. But what we are talking about today should perhaps be called Prussia's malformation because it was Josef Prussia who came into the hospital in Breslau where Epstein was working and attracted his attention to the lesion we now name in honor of Wilhelm. 
Yosef was 19 years old. He was complaining of shortness of breath, palpitations. He'd had them since he'd been a child. He was blue. His heart was big. It was full of murmurs. Sadly, he didn't last long in the hospital and died about a week after his admittance. And this is why we now remember Yosef Pressure. These are the drawings that were made by Dr. Weiss of the heart that was seen at the autopsy that was conducted by Wilhelm Epstein. Here you're looking at the inlet aspect of the abnormal heart. You see there's a small remnant of the septal leaflet and there's a tongue of tissue that joins together the anterosuperior and the inferior leaflets. And the consequence of this is that the valvar orifice is looking into the outflow tract of the right ventricle. Here is the outlet view of the malformed valve. And now you see that remnant of the septal leaflet. And the anterosuperior leaflet has a linear attachment. And in consequence of this linear attachment, the valve closes in bifoliate fashion. And that is the feature I'm going to be emphasizing for you. So if we are to understand the abnormal anatomy that we're going to be looking at, we need to make comparisons with normal tricuspid valve because that will permit us to understand the variations I'm going to emphasize. But as I intimated, we're going to start off by looking at what happens during development. And I've been learning a lot about development over the past 12 months or so, because I've had the privilege of working with Wout Lamas, and Jill Hickspoors from the University of Maastricht. And Wout and Jill have made interactive PD files that show the development of the human heart throughout the period of embryonic development, which lasts from four to eight weeks of gestation. And this is a reconstruction they've made of a human embryo at the end of embryonic development, what we call Carnegie stage 23, when the embryo is eight weeks old. In yellow, you see the atrioventricular canal myocardium. By now, this has been sequestrated to form the vestibule of what will be the tricuspid valve. There you see the right ventricular aspect of the muscular ventricular septum and to the top of the screen, you see the underside of the leaflets of the developing pulmonary root. By now, the proximal cushions that separate the outflow tract into the aortic and pulmonary channels have muscularized, and they've committed the aortic root to the left ventricle. But here is the focus of our attention. That is the developing tricuspid valve. And I hope you will immediately note that it has only two leaflets at this stage. We can confirm that by looking at serial sections. And this is a serial section through a data set from the Human Development Biology Resource that is now available for study in the United Kingdom. It's a little younger than the embryo I showed you a moment ago, Carnegie Stage 22. It's a four chamber section. But what we see there are the fused atrioventricular cushions that will form the member of the septum, but they will also delaminate to form the septal leaflet of the valve. But as yet, there's been de no delamination. There is the lateral cushion, which will form the anterosuperior leaflet. I can now return to another data set from the Human Developmental Biology Resource, and this time we can look at it in the same cutting plane as I showed you in that reconstruction that was made by Jill. So there you're looking into the right ventricle, and there you see the aortic root. So it's the equivalent of the oblique subcostal cut made by echocardiographers. And there, at the level of the atrioventricular junction, you see the undelaminated septal leaflet. And there you see the line of union between the superior and the inferior atrioventricular cushions that have formed this leaflet. You can also see the anterior superior leaflet. And what I want to emphasize is the angle 
between the atrioventricular junction, which when we look at the heart attitudinally is vertical, and the level of the hinge of the anterosuperior leaflet. And you see it's rotated away from the atrioventricular junction at the inner heart curvature. And that now separates the inlet from the apical trabecular component of the ventricle. And as yet, there has been no delamination of the leaflets so that the effective valve R orifice is between this inlet component and the apical component and is looking towards the infundibulum, just as it was in the heart of Joseph pressure. So the key to development is the delamination of the leaflets that lift the valve R orifice back to the level of the atrioventricular junction. Now, if we look at the normal tricuspid valve, we can appreciate that the normal valve does have three leaflets, and that is because with normal development from the stage we looked at in embryonic development, there is the formation of the third leaflet, which is located inferiorly. We can see that in this rather nice virtual data set made of an adult by my good friend and colleague, Shumpei Mori. Shumpei made this whilst he was working in Kobe in Japan, but now he's working at the University of California in Los Angeles. And these virtual data sets show us anatomy as it should be seen in the context of the living heart. So there you see the anterior superior leaflet, the septal leaflet, and now we see that third leaflet of the valve that is formed subsequent to the end of embryonic development, and it is positioned inferiorly. It is not posterior, although that is still as it is often described. The key point now, with formation of that inferior leaflet, the valve will close in trifoliate fashion, and that, of course, is why we call it the tricuspid valve. So if we look at it in the same aspect as I showed you in the developing heart, this is one of the beautiful images made by Diane Spicer. Diane also started her career in Pittsburgh. And Diane is emphasizing that when we photograph the heart in attitudinally appropriate fashion, the atrioventricular junction is vertical. And the union between the inlet and the apical trabecular component is angulated away from the inner heart curvature. And that permits us to understand what is going on when the valve is malformed. Now, time is not going to permit me to discuss with you any great detail the features of valve art dysplasia. I will briefly mention segmental combinations and associated malformations, but what I want to emphasize is the anatomy itself in the setting of Epstein's malformation in the setting of concordant atrioventricular connections, because the key to the variation is the location of that valvar orifice. And this goes back to some work I did with Christian Schreiber. Christian sadly no longer with us. He came and he worked with me at the end of the 20th century whilst I was still at the Brompton Hospital. And we looked at 23 examples of Epstein's malformation. And when we put in the location of that valvar orifice, as I've shown you, it is displaced away from the atrioventricular junction in rotational fashion. I know that echocardiographers talk about downward displacement, but when we put this displacement in the setting of the heart within the body, the rotation, it is a rotational displacement rather than a downward displacement. And it is the variation in that rotation that is the key to understanding. So this, in fact, is one of the hearts from the Pittsburgh archive. And I cut my teeth learning about Epstein's malformation in the archive at Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. So there you see the anterosuperior leaflet. And just as in the heart of Joseph pressure, there is a tongue joins together the conjoined septal and inferior leaflets with that anterior superior leaflet. 
And now you see beautifully in this specimen, the rotational displacement of the conjoined septal and inferior leaflets away from the plane of the atrioventricular junction. And it is that rotational displacement that gives us this bifoliate configuration of the malformed valve. And we see that beautifully in this heart also, but is remarkably reminiscent of the drawing that Wilhelm Ebstein made of the heart of Josef Pressure. So there in this heart, you see how the valvar orifice, the keyhole is looking into the infundibulum of the right ventricle. And it is closing in bifoliate fashion by consequence of the linear attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet. But the anterosuperior leaflet is not always attached in linear fashion. So in this example, which to me as a morphologist is less severe, we have focal attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet. You can see there the anterosuperior leaflet with a normal attachment between the medial papillary muscle, the anterosuperior papillary muscle. And there you see that the septal leaflet, the inferior leaflet in this particular heart are deficient. There is far less valvar tissue formed and it would be much harder in this heart for the surgeon to make the cone of valvar tissue that is the essence of the procedure described by Dr. Da Silva. So we see in fact, the potential to form the cone of valvar tissue much better when we have this linear attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet and the keyhole is looking into the infundibulum of the right ventricle. And now we see the atrialized inlet component with that linear attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet, the connecting tongue with the inferior leaflet. And the task of the surgeon now is to do what the embryo was trying to do, to try to return that valvar orifice from the union between the atrialized inlet to the level of the atrioventricular junction. And so it is when there is this linear attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet that the surgeon will be best placed in creating the cone of leaflet tissue that is the essence of Dr. Da Silva's approach to surgical treatment. On occasion, however, we can have an imperforate Ebstein's malformation, and that is because the keyhole is closed. So the key surgical variation is that distal attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet. And it is a spectrum of malformation. The focal attachment, may, when it may well be much harder for the surgeon to create that cone of leaflet tissue, the hyphenated attachment to that linear attachment, which is, in my experience, the most usual surgical variation, remembering that on occasion, the valve can be imperforate. A couple of other key surgical points to bear in mind. We find the atrioventricular node where we expect it to be. It's at the apex of the triangle of cock because the triangle of cock itself will not have been distorted by the presence of Epstein's malformation. We should also remember the right coronary artery because of course the right coronary artery is within the right atrioventricular junction, which is going to be markedly dilated in the setting of florid Ebstein's malformation. So there's always the danger of kinking that right coronary artery when the surgeon seeks to reduce the size of that right orifice. Now thus far, I've only spoken about Ebstein's malformation in the setting of concordant atrioventricular connections, but we all know that when we have congenitally corrected transposition, and when in usual atrial arrangement, the tricuspid valve is left-sided, then in the majority of cases, left-sided tricuspid valve shows features that have much in common with Ebstein's malformation, not identical, so now we call this the Ebstenoid variant. And very rarely, however, the mitral valve can show evidence of Ebstein's malformation 
But then, in the setting of Ebstein's malformation, it is the mural leaflet that is displaced rather than the septal leaflet. Don't forget the associated malformations. In most instances, there will be an atrial septal defect. Rare, much more rarely, there can be a ventricular septal defect or even an atrio ventricular septal defect. Pulmonary stenosis is frequent. When we find pulmonary atresia in the setting of an intact ventricular septum, then again, Epstein's malformation of the tricuspid valve is a frequent finding. And for the arrhythmologists, we must remember that because the malformation deforms the right atrioventricular junction, in many cases, we have wolf parkinson white syndrome. So if I summarize, the major point to bear in mind is that there is displacement of the septal and inferior leaflets, and that reflects the failure of delamination during development. But that displacement is rotational, although when seen in echocardiographic images, it seems to be downward. The consequence of the displacement, the valvar orifice is a keyhole in florid cases, and it's looking into the infundibulum. It is at the junction between the atrialized inlet component and the functional right ventricle. What I hope I have emphasized is that as far as the surgeon is concerned, the major variation involves that distal attachment of the anterosuperior leaflet. And it's perhaps a paradox that when I see less well-formed cases with focal attachment, it might be harder for the surgeon in this instance to make the cone of leaflet tissue, that as I've emphasized, is the essence of the repair that was uh, put forward and has revolutionized the treatment, the, the repair put forward by Dr. Da Silva. Remember, epstenoid malformation is frequent in the setting of congenital corrected transposition. And don't forget those associated malformations, but the major take home point, the lack of delamination of those septal and inferior leaflets has given rotational ro displacement of that valvar orifice that typically is a keyhole looking into the infundibulum of the right ventricle, just as it was in that heart of Josef Prescher seen by Dr. Epstein so long ago. Thank you so much for permitting me to share my experience with you. And I'm looking forward for the to the remainder of this exciting seminar. Thank you, Professor Anderson, for this wonderful presentation. Now we will follow with the video demonstration of heart specimens by Mr. William Devine. He is a retired curator of the Frank and Sherman and Carol Lennon Heart Museum, Department of Pathology at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Hello, I'm Bill Devine, and I'd like to demonstrate to you hearts that have Epstein's anomalies. I am a faculty member of UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and also a faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. I'd like to start by first looking at the normal heart. Since we're talking about Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve, we're going to look closely at the anatomy of the right side of the heart. So we're going to open up the right heart and first look at the right atrium. This is a right atrium because we have these pectinate muscles coming off the terminal crest all the way around towards the coronary sinus, the vestibule, that tells you this is a morphologic right atrium. Here's the oval fossa, coronary sinus, and the tendon of the daro is here coming down towards the central fibrous body. Here's the annulus of the tricuspid valve. This forms a triangle of hulk. Right here is also the area of the membranous septum. If we look on edge here, get a little closer, 
we can see the atrial muscle here, ventricular muscle here, and we have fibrous adipose tissue with the right coronary artery here. And this fibrous adipose tissue actually extends, and you can see it in this heart, all around the junction. Now the annulus of the tricuspid valve is not a fibrous cord, but it's fibrous adipose tissue, and this is hinged along this region. And this hinge point and annulus are one and the same in the normal heart. If we look at this right ventricle, we can divide a ventricle into an inlet portion, apical portion, and outlet portion. This is a right ventricle because you have these coarse trabeculations going up the septal surface. We have a tricuspid valve, and we have a muscular sleeve separating the tricuspid valve from the arterial valve, that is the pulmonary valve. This is the medial papillary muscle. When you have an Epstein's anomaly, what has happened is that part of the leaflets of the tricuspid valve fail to delaminate from the wall, and actually the hinge point of the valve is depressed within the ventricle. So when you have this failure to delaminate from the wall, the septal leaflets or other leaflets of the tricuspid valve, it turns into a rotational type of defect pivoting around the site of the membranous septum or the central fibrous body, you pivot this way. And what happens is, if we look at this normal heart, you can see that the opening of the tricuspid valve is pointing towards the apex or the apical component of the right ventricle. But in Epstein's anomaly, it is rotated so that that orifice is now pointing out the pulmonary outflow tract. That is one of the characteristics of an Epstein's anomaly. And in doing so, sometimes we'll end up with a nice shelf of muscle here, reduced part of the apical component, and we have very th and thinning of the atrial and ventricular walls, calling atrialization of this right side of the heart. So the right atrium and part of the inlet of the right ventricle become atrialized and act like an atrium. This is a heart with an Epstein's anomaly, and we're looking at the right side of this heart, right atrium, here is the annulus of the tricuspid valve of the septal leaflet. Here is the anterior superior leaflet, and here is part of the posterior leaflet. And we can see right here, if you go in closer, that this part of the septal leaflet, the septal leaflet here, has not completely delaminated from the wall of the right ventricle, thus putting the orifice of the tricuspid valve within the ventricle, and you can see that it's rotating around the central fibrous body, around the area of the membranous septum in this fashion, and that the orifice of the tricuspid valve is now starting to face out the outlet of the right ventricle. And when you have this displacement, or this delamination that did not occur, tend to get a shelf-like area here, and you start losing part of your apical component, and also you end up with atrialization or thinning of the this part of the inlet of the right ventricle. This would be better showed in this larger specimen, which shows the natural history of an unrepaired Epstein's anomaly. It shows you the natural history of what happens when an Epstein's anomaly in some patient is not repaired. We open up, we see this very dilated, very large right side of the heart. Uh, the ventricular part of this ventricle is very thin, so it's atrialized. And you can see that this whole area of this heart is very dilated, will act like a an atrium. You can see here nicely this sharp, this shelf-like area with tethering of the cords. Here we have the septal leaflet. You can see this long cell-like anterior superior leaflet and also the posterior leaflet is involved. You can see that the septal leaflet and posterior leaflets have this tongue of valvar tissue that comes up and connects the anterior superior leaflet with the posterior and septal leaflets, and you can see that the outlet now 
from this right ventricle is towards the pulmonary trunk because the Epstein's anomaly has this rotational appearance. If we open at the outlet, we can see that the outlet actually is also dilated. You can see very thin wall of the outlet of the right ventricle. This is not usual finding, but when you have end stage natural Epstein's anomaly, uh, you, end, you can end up with this appearance. Here is the pulmonary valve here. If we close this up in this manner, we can see that now the outlet is pointing towards the pulmonary trunk and not towards the apical part of the right ventricle. Now it this specimen is showing even more detail. We're looking again now at a very large unrepaired Epstein's anomaly showing the natural history of this disease in this patient. We look in there we can see this very dilated thin-walled atrium and ventricle and if we look down into here we can see that the orifice of the tricuspid valve now points now points out to the pulmonary trunk and not into the um, apical part of the heart. If we turn this heart so that we're looking at the outflow track of the right ventricle, you can see this bifolate abnormal part of the tri uh, tricuspid valve that is pointing directly out the outflow track of the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. And essentially, the inlet and apical part in this heart have been atrialized. The surgeon can use part of this muscle, and it is muscle, to create the new position of the tricuspid valve at the level of the annulus. We look on this side, though, we see we have the valve, this part of the bifolate valve tethered to the heart, but if you look closely, it's very close, and you have to be cognizant of the right coronary artery. This smaller heart shows a very severe Epstein's anomaly. You can see that the septal leaflet is not delaminated. You can see that the anterior superior leaflet and actual part of the posterior leaflet are all sail-like. Here is your outlet. Remember, the defect in an Epstein's anomaly has a rotational effect for the orifice of the tricuspid valve, and it points out the pulmonary tract, but this heart has pulmonary atresia. So there's valvar atresia in this heart, and there is an association between Epstein's anomaly and pulmonary valvar atresia. Many thanks, Bill and Professor Anderson. Now uh, we're going to proceed with our, our program. And next speaker is Dr. Libby Lamford. Uh, Libby is um, a, the interim director of the Ecolab, um, very talented imager with us. She's associate professor in pediatrics um, here. And she'll be talking about echocardiography, what we need to know. Thank you. Good morning, I've been asked to describe the echocardiographic findings in Epstein's anomaly in 15 minutes. Um, obviously the tricuspid valve is a very uh, complex structure. I think most of us in the echocardiography world uh, try to avoid describing it very carefully. Um, in the last several years working with the De Silva's, I've learned a lot and most of the have learned that there's more to learn so in this 15 minutes, I thought I would take you through uh, two cases with Epstein's anomaly that I thought were fairly informative for us. No disclosures. This first infant is an infant who had a prenatal diagnosis of Epstein's anomaly with significant tricuspid insufficiency. 
Their small local medical center said that they had no treatment to offer the infant post-birth. The family sought out the De Silva's and relocated to Pittsburgh and the infant was delivered here. This is her newborn echo. As mentioned by Professor Anderson, the classic echo criteria is the inferior displacement of the septal leaflet. So looking at an apical four chamber view, you see left atrium, left ventricle, dilated right atrium, right ventricle. And here is the septal leaflet, which certainly is displaced inferiorly. Um, I never really noticed before, but as we look, this leaflet here, which is probably a combination of the inferior and anterior leaflet, um, is fairly mobile. And there appears to be a reasonable RV anterior wall. When we add color, we see that this newborn had severe tricuspid valve insufficiency. The view that I like the most in infants and young children is the subcostal views, because you can actually get on fast views and fairly easily identify the three leaflets. I will say as the valve gets abnormal, it becomes harder and harder to distinguish exactly which leaflet is which. So this is a subcostal four chamber view um, to orient. It's gonna be head, head, feet, rightward and leftward. And we've actually tipped somewhat into the RV outflow tract because as has been mentioned, the coaptation point of the tricuspid valve is, in the, is tipped, rotated towards the RVOT. So this is a view that is very useful for that. And we can see the dilated right atrium this portion here is the atrialized right ventricle. The coaptation point of your tricuspid valve here is rotated into the proximal right ventricular outflow tract. She actually has a fairly good RV apex that is part of the functional RV, a well-developed RV outflow tract. And you get a hint here that we see fairly often of sort of a dilated right ventricular outflow tract right below the pulmonary valve. And again, note that this tricuspid insufficiency is directed inferiorly. The peak TR gradient was 12 millimeters of mercury, so quite low for a newborn. We uh, struggled with whether this patient had a patent pulmonary valve because her RV was only able to generate 12 millimeters of mercury, which would not be enough to open a pulmonary valve in a neonate. Um, the question is, is it an abnormality of the RV myocardium or is it that there's so much TR that the RV just cannot generate pressure. Surprisingly, there's a remarkably normal tricuspid flow Doppler inflow pattern across the tricuspid valve with ENAs. So at least we know we found the functioning tricuspid valve. So again, my favorite, the subcostal views. In infants and young children, you can get an on fast view of the tricuspid valve. It's a subcostal short axis view rotated into the plane of the tricuspid valve. So for orientation, it's again, head, feet, anterior, posterior, LV, mitral valve, septum. So here is your septal leaflet. And you can see this very redundant anterior leaflet, which really does not appear to have a lot of attachments to the right ventricular outflow tract. But then there's sort of a large chunk missing, right? There's no obvious inferior leaflet and there is a very large gap here. Again, as you notice, this RV alpha tract is well contractile, somewhat dilated. And here there appear to be pulmonary valve leaflets. If we look at the color flow, this broad red jet in the MPA is ductal flow, supplying flow to the lungs, but we never see any forward or retrograde flow across the pulmonary valve. And again, we weren't sure whether this was functional or true pulmonary atresia. This infant went on to have a STARS procedure done at nine days of age. This consists of a fenestrated closure of the tricuspid valve, which is this patch sitting in the atrium. Um, it still bothers me because as an echocardiography, tricuspid valve should be over here, but here's your mitral valve. This patch sits higher than the mitral valve. There was a right atrial reduction atrioplasty and a large atrial septectomy, a BT shunt. And again, intraoperatively, it was confirmed that the pulmonary valve was atretic. 
you see that the RV now is much smaller. You actually see, again, as I pointed out, that this child has fairly well-developed anterolateral RV wall. And the tricuspid valve leaflets are now all compressed in this small cavity, so you can no longer really assess the anatomy and function of these leaflets. So when we evaluate patients who've had a Starnes for further surgical interventions, I really like to look at the newborn echocardiogram to assess the tricuspid valve leaflet attachments, morphology, motion. There's a fenestration in that patch. So there is two fro flow across that right atrial patch. Again, surprisingly to me, there's a normal inflow pattern for an infant in ENA wave. And there is tricuspid insufficiency. This infant had a peak TR gradient of 23 millimeters of mercury. We think that it is uh, reassuring if the RV is able to generate a pressure for perhaps being able to recruit this right ventricle for future use rather than going down a single ventricle palliation. At three months of age, this infant had a glen and a surgical pulmonary valvotomy, and then at 17 months of age had a De Silva cone procedure associated with a pulmonary valve repair ASD, fenestration closure, limited right atrial maze. The glen was left in place. As we now look at her postoperative images, you can see the two leaflets of the cone. You can see, as again, she has a fairly good RV anterior wall, and now she has a fairly large functional RV. When we look at the function of that tricuspid valve, I'm so amazed by these. We see some color flow disturbance, mosaic color, suggesting that she does have an element of tricuspid valve stenosis, but this little tiny jet is all of the tricuspid valve insufficiency that she has. So her mean tricuspid valve gradient is mild at 4.4 millimeters of mercury. She has trivial tricuspid insufficiency with a TR gradient that runs around 29 millimeters of mercury. She still is one and a half physiology, so we left her Glen. She was hospitalized for this current procedure for approximately one week and had really no major postoperative complications. She is now about three years of age and clinically doing well. Her systemic saturation is 96% with a small bidirectional atrial level shunt on echo. Her tricuspid valve function has stayed stable. We re-echoed her a couple of weeks ago. Um, she does have moderate RV dysfunction by echocardiogram, but you wouldn't know it based on her clinical course. Moving to another example is, this is an 18-year-old with Epstein's anomaly who had a BT shunt as a neonate. He has a patent pulmonary valve who just happened to move to the Pittsburgh area, independent of the DeSilvas. At his first clinic visit in cardiology, his baseline stat was 81% that dropped to 63% with walking down the hallway. So we, um, he had very poor transthoracic images. So we had a TE to assess what interventions we could offer. And so this is a transesophageal echo at zero degrees. So similar to an apical four chamber view, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, atrialized right ventricle. And again, the classic echo criteria is inferior displacement of the septal leaflet, but in this view, there is no septal leaflet. The mitral valve's here, your septal leaflet should be in here. So very abnormal septal leaflet, not at all visible. And what was most striking, and as I was preparing for this conference, I learned, it's probably well known, there is a very abnormal inferior leaflet here. You can barely see it with these small little attachments that is tethered. In addition, unlike the prior patient, I don't really get a sense of any true my RV myocardium on the other side of that leaflet. We pulled the probe out a little bit to get into the left ventricular outflow tract, and all of a sudden we see that septal leaflet. It's been rotated into the outflow tract. And here is an anterior leaflet that appears to be moving fairly well. So to go looking for where the functional tricuspid valve, where the leaflets actually co op we've moved on to a short axis view. So this will be left atrium, right atrium, 
ASD. Here is your atrialized right ventricle. Here is that inferior leaflet with multiple attachments that doesn't really appear to move at all. And what was interesting about this one, teaching us the importance of communication between echo docs and the surgeons, is that when they opened this heart, all they saw was endocardium. They did not realize that there was a leaflet there. Um, Dr. De Silva cut in and was able to find this plane, but the moral to me was that I need to make sure that the surgeon knows when I see a leaflet, because um, there are multiple attachments and you can see that there is a plane that you can get into to free that leaflet up from the RV wall. And here we're starting to see the leaflets co out. With rotation of the TE probe, we can open up a hint of the palmar valve. That's this sort of white leaflets moving in and out here. Here is a coaptation point of the tricuspid valve. So this small RV outflow tract is the only functional part of the RV. This functional RV has a bulge, but the systolic function looks fairly good. Intraoperatively, they found that this area of the RV outflow tract had multiple areas of fatty tissue with absence of the myocardium. So unfortunately, this child has a fairly abnormal RV. And then this is just looking at 90 degrees to find the, the flow across that tricuspid valve. Again, they think that this is probably septal and a little bit of the anterior leaflet. And then when we look with color, we see moderate tricuspid insufficiency, again, directed inferiorly. I apologize for this image quality, but I wanted to show the um, abnormal attachments that you can see in that anterior leaflet. So this is a transgastric view by TE. So head, feet, left atrium, mitral valve, aortic valve, ventricular septum, and so this is focused on the right ventricular outflow tract. And so you see this very abnormal septal leaflet here. It's almost like a loop of tissue attached to the septum, which is now at the level of the aortic valve. And here is that anterior leaflet, which is mobile, but clearly has an attachment in the right ventricular outflow tract. The pulmonary valve would be up here. So again, this is our coaptation point that has moved all the way into the RV outflow tract. And the true functional RV is only this small area. Um, again, I was so sort of uh, overwhelmed by this inferior leaflet here. This is the pre-cone picture that I've already shown you with the multiple attachments. This is actually post-cone, and you can see that the De Silva's were able to free up this inferior leaflet and to use it to form the cone. And if you look, I think there's actually little nubbins of tissue that I think are the remnants of all of those attachments to that leaflet. So for his surgical intervention, he underwent a De Silva cone repair, RV plication, valve closure of his atrial septal defect, RF ablation of his tricuspid valve annulus and cable tricuspid isthmus, and takedown of his, in, of his BT shut. And I was totally amazed by this result. So now we have what looks like a tricuspid valve with two leaflets, the cone, we can see low velocity flow, we don't see any turbulence in this um, inflow. We see that there are fenestrations in the cone to allow flow into the right ventricle. You can actually see this fenestration by 2D. And I think there's another fenestration which causes this red jet to swirl. There is no tricuspid valve insufficiency seen in that image. I went through the whole study and the only insufficiency we found was this tiny fenestration here. And if you look very closely, there's a little blue jet and a little red jet. That little dot here of red flow was all the tricuspid valve insufficiency that was seen in the operating room. So I do a lot of echoes in the OR and one of the most frustrating things for us is assessing valve insufficiency immediately post-op because two to three days later, it's frequently very different. So I wanted to, oops, bring to you the pictures of what he looked like five months afterwards. This is the last echo we have on him. Again, his tricuspid valve leaflets move well. Here is his color flow. 
Now we do see a little bit of turbulence in the OR, his mean gradient across the sarcastic valve was two. It's come up a little bit. But again, the only insufficiency that you are seeing is this tiny little blue jet. To find again the picture with the most TR, this was the most prominent tricuspid insufficiency I could find on his study. It was interpreted as trivial. He has a mean tricuspid valve gradient of five, four to five, and a peak TR gradient of 16 millimeters of mercury, which was certainly better than his peak TR gradient, which was preoperatively was 10. His SATs have gone from his pre-op of 81% to post-op of 91%. He is now only on aspirin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hulan, for, for this uh, beautiful presentation. Now we will have um, uh, interesting diagnostic images by, presented by Dr. Adam Christopher. He is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh, director of cardiac MRI and CT program here at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, again, I'm the, the director of cardiac MRI and CT here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And uh, as we've just seen from Dr. Lanford, uh, echocardiography is our mainstay of evaluating the tricuspid valve, uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively uh, in Epstein anomaly. But I wanted to touch on some of the complementary advanced imaging modalities that we can use uh, to further assess the tricuspid valve. So we'll just look at uh, both pre and post-operative assessment of the, not only the valve, but also the right ventricle, focusing on the right ventricular function uh, and volumes. And we'll look briefly at 3D echocardiography, what it has to offer, uh, as well as cardiac CT, and then focus the bulk of this talk on cardiac MRI, as it really has become uh, the ideal secondary modality to evaluate the, the tricuspid valve and right ventricle. So I want to start, uh, again, just by touching on 3D echo. And for all the imager, imagers in the audience, uh, you know that um, you know, it's, it's readily available. We have these probes around, uh, but often we defer to, to 2D echo. Um, clearly, there's no radiation involved. And if we're doing transthoracic 3D echo, there's no anesthesia involved, though TEE is a different story. Um, but it provides detailed and dynamic imaging. Um, so we really can get a feel for the depth and attachments of these valves and how they relate to the, the ventricle and the outflow tract. Obviously, 3D echo is dependent on the windows, even more so than 2D echo. Um, and unfortunately, currently, 3D TEE is limited to those get, that can tolerate an adult TEE probe, so those over 20 kilograms. Uh, and again, I'm sure imagers would agree there's a significant learning curve associated with 3D echo. Uh, and so especially in the heat of the moment in the, in the OR, uh, being able to not only orient yourself and optimize an image, but then orient the surgeon to what you're seeing uh, in order to help uh, their uh, approach is certainly uh, a skill to be worked on. But I just wanted to share a couple of, of relevant 3D echo images here. So again, you'll see uh, TEE in a mid-esophageal view as well as a transgastric view, similar to what we just saw in Dr. Lanford's talk. But I wanted to add uh, from that same patient, uh, this is in a 10-year-old with uh, Epstein's and severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is a, a surgeon's view, or close to it, uh, looking down from the right atrium. The intraatrial septum is here on the left of the image. Uh, the aortic root is up here. Uh, and so you can appreciate, again, that apically displaced hinge point of the septal leaflet here along the interventricular septum this sail-like uh, anteroseptal leaflet, uh, and we'll see a bit better from the inferior perspective, some of those attachments of that leaflet. And then again, that somewhat deficient inferior leaflet or posterior leaflet down here. <laughs> 
turning that around and looking up from above, this is again a, a transgastric uh, acquisition uh, in the upper right here. Um, I just wanna focus your attention. So looking up from below, we have the left ventricle here on the right, and up from the right ventricular apex. Again, you can appreciate some of these uh, attachments of the anterior septal leaflet to the free wall and the relationship of the valve to the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary valve. This is now that same patient in the initial uh, post-operative period following the disabled cone procedure. Uh, you can see by, by standard metesophageal views, there's just trivial tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and by, again, a transgastric view, uh, looking up on FOSS at the cone, you could appreciate some of the accessory tissue left on that anterior aspect of the valve, um, but otherwise excellent coaptation there. So then if we focus on these 3D echo images, uh, again, from looking up from below, uh, you can see uh, some of that accessory tissue surrounding the cone. Um, and again, uh, relationship between the right ventricular outflow tract and that new valve. And then lastly, uh, the surgical perspective from above, again, interventricular septum here, aortic root up here. So this is the septal aspect of the new cone uh, and more of an anterior free wall aspect here. I just wanna point out, even when the valve is co-opting here in systole, you can see there's a, a bit of a groove left uh, along that anteroseptal area. I think that's one of the beauties of the cone is that there doesn't have to be a single plane of co-optation uh, right up at the AV groove. Uh, but in fact, that cone you know, can come together even just below the annulus uh, here. And so we're still left with minimal, uh, just trivial tricuspid regurgitation. So, so I think you'll uh, agree there are certainly some advantages to intraoperative use of 3D echo, but uh, I want to just touch on cardiac CT as well. So the pros here are clearly rapid acquisition and very high resolution, surpassing uh, cardiac MR. I'll just pause this axial uh, stack here as we come down into the uh, large atrialized right ventricle and, and focus on, again, that anteroseptal leaflet here and how you can appreciate, especially as we come back up, some of the attachments uh, to that anterior free wall. So really high resolution imaging of the valve. The cons obviously are the radiation uh, involved with CT, though that has improved dramatically in recent years. Um, and I'll put a caveat on this limited dynamic imaging. So obviously with modern uh, volume scanners, we're able to at, at reasonable radiation doses do a complete functional analysis and get dynamic imaging of this tricuspid valve. Um, but, uh, but we're still left with a lack of flow data by CT. And that's where uh, MR really stands to, um, to give us the, the additional data we're looking for. So as I said, I want to now focus the, the back half of the talk on cardiac MRI uh, and what it has to offer us in the setting of uh, Epstein malformation. So the pros and one of the reasons we refer almost every patient for preoperative cardiac MRI is the quantitative ventriculography you get from it to assess not only the ventricular volume, but also the function of the functional right ventricle, um, as well as the dynamic and flow data that we'll review. Obviously, MRI is radiation-free, but the real cons are the acquisition time, uh, as well as the compliance. So in all of our younger and early school-aged patients, MRI uh, will often require sedation and even intubation at times to get them through the scan and, and at, get adequate breath holds. So uh, again, for the imagers in the audience, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, JCMR position statement. It's a really nice reference for cardiac MR protocols for a variety of congenital heart diseases, but notably as well for Epstein anomaly. I refer back to this frequently uh, for standard protocols here. So I just wanna to touch on what we benefit, uh, what we get out of ventriculography, tricuspid valve cine imaging, phase contrast imaging, as well as uh, 3D imaging. We almost always perform either a contrast enhanced MRA or a 3D SSFP to be able to reformat this data. So uh, just looking first at quantitative ventriculography, you know, we standardly for any cardiac MRI will acquire uh, a four chamber view. You can see in this patient with Epstein anomaly had, had previously had an ASD closure device uh, placed in the interatrial septum here. So there's some uh, susceptibility artifact from that, but, uh, but I'll focus your attention on uh, again, the, 
function of the functional right ventricle down here, uh, as well as the uh, deviation of the interventricular septum. So standardly, we'll acquire, uh, we'll, we'll place a series of slices through this four-chamber view and acquire a series of, a series of short axis uh, slices to assess the ventricular volume and function. You can see here we've traced in red, occasionally you'll see the little outlines come through, the left ventricular endocardium. But in the setting of, trick of uh, Epstein anomaly, it becomes very difficult to trace the functional right ventricle, again, because of the rotational variability of that uh, annulus. And so it's standard, uh, and we standardly acquire a stack of four chamber views in Epstein anomaly so that we can more accurately assess the functional right ventricle all the way up from the inferior surface of the heart to the right ventricular outflow tract uh, and get nice accurate volumes and functional assessment. I want to talk a bit more a bit more about uh, focusing in on the tricuspid valve anatomy. Um, and so we do that again from that four chamber view. If we uh, place again a slice along the interventricular septum there to create this view, a three chamber view, much like the subcostal views Dr. Lanford was showing, as well as the anatomic specimens we saw from Dr. Anderson earlier this morning, um, you can appreciate again a, a right ventricular three chamber view with the right atrium a portion of the atrialized right ventricle, and then you can appreciate the rotational abnormality of the plane of that tricuspid valve uh, and its relation to the pulmonary valve up here. So then we can, again, place a plane perfectly par parallel with the plane of the tricuspid valve, and then be able to assess it on FOSS and see, again, uh, the degree of coaptation or lack thereof, and again, assess many of the attachments between that anteroceptal leaflet and the free wall. I want to briefly touch on the phase contrast imaging or flow data that we can acquire by cardiac MR. So we'll frequently acquire an on FOSS flow image of the tricuspid valve. And so you can see in red uh, is the inflow in diastole here, and then, uh, I'm sorry, in blue is the inflow, and then in red is the tricuspid valve regurgitation. So this gives us an estimate, a rough estimate of the regurgitation fraction of the tricuspid valve. You can see in this setting, we've got 45% regurgitation through this valve, consistent with severe tricuspid regurgitation. However, the challenge there is that the, the plane of that annulus is moving in and out of our single uh, flow plane. And so it's often limited and we'll end up using a comparison of the PA flow uh, to the stroke volume of the functional right ventricle in order to, to calculate a more accurate tricuspid regurgitation fraction. I just want to make the point as well that uh, 4D flow, which has come down the pike in the last few years, um, stands to dramatically improve our on FOSS assessment of tricuspid regurgitation. So 4D flow is again, phase contrast data in a three-dimensional space, but with the added uh, dimension of time throughout the cardiac cycle. Uh, and so you can see in this patient with Epstein anomaly, we're able to then track the annulus of the functional valve, that orifice, and get a more accurate uh, tricuspid regurgitation fraction of 33% of here. So then I just want to touch uh, and give a few case examples in, of how cardiac MRI added to the echocardiographic picture. So this is a two-year-old patient uh, who, uh, separate, separate patient than the one Dr. Lanford showed earlier by ECHO, um, who presented as a neonate with severe Epstein anomaly and pulmonary atresia. She underwent the STARN procedure as we had seen before, uh, and you can see two fro flow through that fenestrated patch uh, on cardiac MR. Uh, you can also see this very dynamic interventricular septum here. Um, but she, as I said, uh, you know, initially underwent the Starnes procedure with placement of a BTT shunt, uh, as well as subsequent bidirectional Glenn procedure. She then presented at two years of age with progressive desaturation, and so was referred for cardiac MR. Um, not only were we able to assess the flows through that fenestration, but also take a look at her branch pulmonary arteries. And using the flow data that we were just talking about, so you can see here uh, the tricuspid uh, or this patch uh, on FOSS. So you can see the, the two fro flow in red and blue here. You can see a hypoplastic RPA here under the aortic arch. 
Um, and so we were able to compare the flows between the systemic and pulmonary bed uh, and assess a significant collateral burden that was responsible for her desaturation. And so she was therefore referred for cardiac catheterization uh, following this cardiac MR. And then I can't help but show a few uh, MR uh, post-operative images. Again, most of the, the cone patients are doing so well that we have a uh, few indications to send them for cardiac MR after the procedure. Um, but I want to show you this image of a 20-year-old female who is a year status post her silver cone procedure. Um, and uh, again, a similar view of that RV3 chamber view. Uh, we're a bit more uh, posterior, but here's the right atrium the right ventricle, and you can see the pulmonary valve up here. And here's this nicely anchored uh, cone valve. You see a slight element of, of prolapse here, but I want to appreciate uh, the slowly improving function of the formerly atrialized right ventricle here. And then as we play a, a four chamber view here, um, you can see there's just trivial to mild uh, tricuspid regurgitation through that cone. So then I want to conclude that uh, obviously 2D echo is our mainstay of imaging, but that advanced imaging complements that. Uh, that 3D echo is useful, particularly in the perioperative period, um, and that cardiac CT has a growing but still limited utility. Cardiac MRI, however, is really important for surgical candidacy and preoperative planning. Um, thanks so much. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melita Villegas. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons here, and we've had an excellent first session on embryology and diagnosis of the cone procedure of Epstein's anomaly and cone. So we're going to open it up to discussion questions, and we have quite a few questions. So first one. Um, and this might be for Dr. Anderson. So based on research I have done, there's no real cause of the malformation. Is that accurate? Are there any studies being done to determine what causes the defect? None of which I am aware. I think the research is correct. Uh, we know we now have a feel as to why it takes place. I think the presentations we show, saw today showed beautifully that, uh, as I pointed out in, my, in the developmental part to begin my talk, it's a failure of delamination of the leaflets. So we know that that's what's taking place. We don't know as yet why that should happen. I mean, there is minimal data to suggest that lithium exposure was able to cause uh, Epstein's malformation, but I'm unaware of anything beyond that that would give us any clues. Okay, the next question is, is the atrialization of the RV due to the lower pressure felt by that portion of the RV with resultant thinning, or is that region truly atrial histiologically? That is, is this due to the hemodynamic or embryological origins? Well, the, the inlet portion is for sure ventricular. It's ventricular myocardium, so it certainly isn't uh, atrial myocardium. I'm not sure I'm the person to answer the other half of the question. All I can say is that it is it's ventricular myocardium, so it is atrialized in terms of the physiology rather than the anatomy. Okay. Um, this question is for Dr. Lanford. So the tricuspid regurgitation gradient in Epstein's anomaly and pulmonary atresia is high in what situations? can't actually remember ever seeing that, but I would assume it's when your Epstein is competent, right? If your RV can generate a high pressure, um, I think it's the severe TR and the neonatal uh, Epstein's that limits the RV pressure. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, I, I it would say that a higher uh, TR, a higher RV pressure usually talks to about a stronger muscle and stronger ventricle. So we like to see a higher TR gradient often because that reflects that 
you know, makes us think that the, ventric, the ventricle is stronger and will end up having better function after the column. That's, and that's probably what we would think. Any preoperative echocardiographic features that predict a successful repair or those that predict a failure of repair? Um, I have yet to see us say that there was an anatomy that we wouldn't try. Um, I think that the second example I showed, I was very concerned that there would not be a good result. And Dr. De Silva was able to free up that leaflet. Um, I think that that would be more of a surgical question. I'm always asked about attachments in the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, those are the common questions that I get, but I think I'll defer that one to the surgeons. Oh, all right. So I will make some comments. So the most difficult ones were, were those ro really rotated to the RVOT, like that case that uh, Dr. Lanford showed, and uh, eight year old. Uh, in that case, the uh, leaflets were very muscularized, so it was very difficult to find uh, a vulvar tissue, and uh, there was not enough tissue to reconstruct the cone, so we used a piece of autologous pericardium to help it. And another uh, type is the linear attachment, uh, like one piece demonstrated by Dr. Anderson. There is a huge amount of vulvar tissue, but we need to reposition the valve, we need to construct fenestrations to allow the flow to go inside the ventricle. And usually in that type of uh, abstinence, we have a, a hard dysfunction of the right ventricle in the post-operative period. And the focal attachment, the simpler one, has less tissue, but it's easier, the, the surgery and the management in the post-operative period because the function usually is better. Uh, another question for Dr. Lanford. So for the eight-year-old with the BT shun who had a cone procedure, did his functional capacity change post-operative? Post -op. We don't know yet. He's uh, just five months out and with COVID, um, he's not really had much physical activity. I, I too am very interested to see what his physical capacity is going to be. The oxygen levels. Yes. Significant improvement. Right. Well, I, he could, he was the kid that would go down to the 60s walking down the hall. Correct. Um, I think it was a beneficial surgery for for him, I mean, I think the differential, I guess, would be, I, I don't remember the surgical discussion about whether you did this versus a Fontan, but now he has a functioning atrium, which gives him an atrial kick. He has a functioning right ventricular outflow tract. I'm not sure how much RV myocardium recovery he's going to have because his RV myocardium is very abnormal, but I think having the atrial kick, the RV outflow tract kick, I guess, or if that's your... Um, and no longer being shut dependent should make his, um, should be an improvement. And this question is for Dr. Christopher. In relation to RV function after cone procedure, which values do you consider normal? FAC, TAPC, strain, or evaluation in MRI? Right, so the, the FAC and TAPC that mentioned there are, are 2D echocardiographic assessments of the right ventricular function. I think this is where you know, MRI is really valued for its complete volumetric assessment of the function. Um, but I don't, I don't uh, consider, I don't keep a separate standard for folks status post cone. So if, if the RV volumetric uh, ejection fraction is less than 45%, we'll call it abnormal um, at whatever degree it is. But I think it's important to keep the same criteria as you move along and we'll often see slow but progressive improvement in that right particular salt, uh, systolic ejection. And this is more of a general function or question. So in regards to the LV function, are there differences before and after the cone surgery? Can you repeat, please? So as far as LV function is concerned, is there a difference before and after the cone? Yes, as I said before, uh, when there is a linear attachment and the, we remove the valve from the, the, that uh, connection with the right ventricle wall. So usually we have some uh, 
distension of that wall, and then we can have a worse function after the cone. And also, like if you are measuring the ejection fraction, you will lose the regurgitation fraction. So you can have a lower ejection fraction, but still with a output, a better output of the right ventricle. So one of the questions was whether the cone changes the left ventricular function. Oh, the left ventricular function. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the stance procedure in the newborn increases the, the, the output because we have the, the compression of the right ventricle. So uh, usually we have the dysfunction of the left ventricle in the newborn or in the later presentation of the cone. Uh, if we have an older patient with left ventricular dysfunction, it would uh, also a uh, bad right ventricular dysfunction. So it's better to follow with the heart transplant than to uh, the con procedure. But in the younger patients, you, you can recover the function of the left ventricle with the con. I um, wanted I wanted to ask a question to Professor Anderson. I noticed that you mentioned you said Epstein-Oid for uh, when the Epstein um, the, the, the tricuspid valve is Epstein-Oid in uh, corrected transposition. And so I wonder if there's a difference and why you didn't call it Epstein's anomaly in that setting. I've been taken to task for calling it Epstein's malformation. As you say in the United States, if I was left for my druthers, I would call it Epstein's malformation. The fundamental difference is that in my experience, although Epstein's malformation is common in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition, it's very unusual to have thinning of the inlet component of the morphologically right ventricle, the feature that has been emphasized several times during this morning's presentation. So, for reasons of, that I don't know the answer to, typically that in congenitally corrected transposition, that inlet myocardium retains its thickness. I've seen a couple of cases where it has been thinned as in florid uh, arrangement of concordant atrioventricular connection, but it's because of that retention of the thickness of the inlet myocardium that I was pressed, and it's David Barron, who is now in Toronto. Previously, I worked with David in Birmingham, and David took me to task for calling it Epstein's malformation and said I should call it the Epsteinoid malformation. So I am I always do what my surgical colleagues tell me. So that's why I now call it the Epsteinoid malformation. While I'm talking, can I pose a question to Luciana? Because I've grown up through the surgical treatment of Epstein's malformation. And there's no question that the cone repair that you and your husband have, uh, revol have produced has revolutionized the treatment. In the old days, when it was the Hardy repair, I was uh, very good friends with Gordon Danielson, who was the major proponent of that. And at the Mayo Clinic then, there were still patients where they would opt for replacement of the tricuspid valve rather than opting for a hardy repair. In your experience now, I note that you say you can use pericardium to make up if it is a deficient cone. Can, can I take it then that you would not now opt for tricuspid valve replacement? Uh, Dr. Anderson, in our life, in our experience, we have uh, uh, almost 300 cones done now, and uh, we replaced the valve only in two patients, and the one was uh, Heova Witness that was a, a older late that refused the blood transfusion. So to do a shorter procedure, we opted to, to replace the, that valve. And the other patient was not a real Epstein, was more a dysplasia, and uh, he persistently have uh, uh, insufficiency and symptoms, so we opted to replace the valve. And Dr. Lanford showed, uh, I think, the worst case scenario with the RVOT rotated uh, uh, tricuspid valve. And even in that case, Jose Pedro, uh, and with my help, uh, we were able to uh, reconstruct the valve, creating a very good cone, and the patient is doing really well. So uh, 
nowadays in our experience we, uh, we i would say that is unless it's an unperforated uh epstein like you showed that we never found in our life so i think that one would be the case where we would opt for another type of procedure what a wonderful luciana and thanks very much all the panelists we're going to proceed with the or continuation with our program and um the next um, subject here, we have Erin Colvin, she's supervising for the advanced practice providers here at HBI in Children's Hospital. And um, Erin, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the conference. Um, next, we have a short video. Um, sorry, I'm take my mask off. A short video um, outlining one of our families uh, who it uh, went through the journey here at Children's Hospital, Pittsburgh, UPMC, um, and had their uh, cone procedure. So please enjoy this short video. Six years ago, I had our firstborn, Avery. We found out that she had Epstein's anomaly after I delivered. We had some complications and they took Avery right away to the NICU. After those six weeks, we were able to come home. Avery was stable and actually didn't require any oxygen. The next couple of years, it was letting her grow and develop and encouraging her to you know, be herself and be as active as she could be. She was getting tired with walking and just having trouble keeping up with everybody. So we discussed with our cardiologist uh, what the next steps were. Um, he had mentioned the cone procedure. And after my husband and I started looking it up, we realized that the man who invented it was just a few hours away from us. From the moment we entered the door, we were just super impressed with the organization, the compassion. You know, after meeting with Dr. De Silva and his team, we felt very confident. So when she was four years old, about two years ago, she underwent open heart surgery and had the cone procedure done by Dr. De Silva. The surgery was very successful. You know, as soon as we saw her in the ICU, she was a color that we had never seen before. She was this beautiful pink, um, and I'll, I'll never forget that day. Dr. De Silva, you know, came and talked to us and saw Avery every day, um, and that really made us comfortable. She, she healed so impressively well. Children are just so resilient. And, um, you know, we walked out of there after 10 days. She was walking around the hospital. We walked down to the pharmacy to get the meds. She was walking a further distance than she ever had before in the hospital. It was, it was just amazing. Even as she continued to grow over the next two years, she still does things today that, you know, she was never able to do. We were able to walk the whole zoo a couple months ago. Um, previously to that, you know, we had to take a stroller everywhere we went. So um, we just love to see how she continues to grow and develop. And um, it's just so nice to see her being able to do the things that she wants to do. So we could not thank Dr. De Silva and his team enough um, for our outcome and we wish everyone else the best of luck in their Epstein's journey and thank you for letting us share ours. Hi, my name is Avery. I'm six years old. I had a heart surgery. Now I can do stuff that I couldn't do before. I like the run now. I can walk all the way to the ice cream stand now. I now can tackle Everett. <laughs> I liked how when I was at the hospital, my cousins could mm -hmm. visit me. And yeah. I could um, play with them, but I had to sit on a chair or my bed. And now I don't have those tubes on me. Mm -hmm. So now I'm really good at running now since I already had my heart surgery. Thank you, Dr. Azalea, and thank you, team, for fixing my heart.
Well, uh, that was quite a video. I have to say it's the first time I see it in myself. And uh, it, it really uh, is what this is all about, isn't it? It's about taking care of kids. It's about changing lives. And uh, I have to say in my lifetime as a cardiac surgeon doing pediatrics, there have been few procedures and, and treatments that we've created, instituted that have dramatically changed care. And I have to say that Jose Pedro uh, came up with this brilliant idea and, and he instituted it in Brazil. Um, I believe it was in the early 1990s when he came up with this and did his first case, I believe it was 1993. Uh, 2004, he published a uh, first paper on his new technique, which is obviously we call the cone, which we call it the Da Silva cone repair because you know he's the guy who invented it and, and, and brought it forward. Um, and it's been tremendous having him here in Pittsburgh. He's a, a tremendous human being. And, and you know that story is what this is all about. It's about improving lives. It doesn't matter where it is, but we can change kids' lives and the comp procedure hopefully can, can and, and will help us do that. Um, I am very happy to introduce Jose uh, to the world. Uh, he, I'm sure you all know him. Uh, and he's gonna go over the basic uh, surgical technique of the comb procedure. Jose. Uh, thank you, Dr. Victor, for the kind invitation. And also thanks for the idea of founding uh, the Da Silva Center for Abyssin Anomaly. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to talk about the, the basics of the cone uh, technique. Epstein anomaly presents a large spectrum of morphological variation, which have incited the creation of many surgical repair techniques over the years. The most well-known technique and have helped a lot of patients in the past, before the cone was the Danielson and Carpentier technique. Although they have some limitations, uh, they're, they're with very useful techniques. Uh, here, uh, in this figure depicts the Danielson uh, technique, which is a variation from, from the Hardy Hunter and, and then Hardy technique. And uh, here, you have anterior leaflet, and that allows portion of the right vent. He placed sutures in the annulus, of the, the true annulus, in fact, as well. And here, mattress suture. Then, once he tied them, they do, he does um, transverse plication, and then they de decrease the size of the annulus and get a monocost valve closing with the septum. Uh, this operation is, is good, but he needs to be a very mobile anterior leaflet to perform it since it does not touch the, the leaflet themselves. Uh, because of those limitations, uh, in this series of 184 patients, uh, under the age of 12, actually the mean age of 7.1 years, uh, he was able to repair, uh, to repair the valve in only 28% of the patient and replace the valve in 63% of them. In this follow-up, uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that when you compare replacement versus repair with the Danielson technique, uh, in adult, when we repair the valve, uh, um, about 85% of them, after 15 years, uh, I still didn't have any uh, reoperation. But when you analyze the, the kids that have trichos valve replacement at 15 years, only 40% of them were free of reoperation. Here in the technique of Carpentier, he really detached the uh, part of the anterior, the inferior technique, uh, the inferior uh, leaflet of the tracker swell. Uh, and then uh, he, he placate the ventricle vertically you now and put the valve in the right atrioventricular uh, junction. And then he used the Carpentier ring to reinforce it. Yeah, he operated in the older patients, which are more risky, but he had um, 
10% uh, of mortality, hospital mortality, and in 10 years, mortality uh, survival was uh, 75%. Uh, so, having those things in mind, we have developed an operation in 1993, intended to be a single strategy to approach all the wide variety of anatomical presentation of the anomaly. The base of this operation is to mobilize all uh, the leaflet tissues and then construct a valve in the format of a cone. And so this valve now uh, does not close against the ventricular uh, septum, but close uh, leaflet to leaflet mechanism. Here is the con concept. You see that we detach the leaflet, leaving only a small area of attachment near the apex of the heart. And then uh, if necessary, we make some fenestration and then reposition the valve uh, and the normal atrioventricular junction. So uh, this is a picture showing uh, the beginning of my experience, basically. So what I did, I detached, I had a case that I, I was planning to do a, a Denison technique, which I had learned the Cleveland Clinic. And then uh, when I was there, I saw that it was impossible without touching uh, the leaflet. So I detached the part of the anterior like Carpentier did, even though I didn't know the Carpentier technique, and I was planning to suture it in, in the septum. But then I saw that it was very close to the other side of the anterior leaflet. So I detached the septal aspect of the anterior leaflet and then I rotate this and construct a cone. And the patient uh, did well, even though she had to be reoperated three years after uh, to perfect the repair. So in this case here, we have absent septal leaflet. Uh, and, but this didn't bother to construct the cone because we have enough tissues to ignore the septal leaflet. And here you can see a nice cone with two vertical sutures and a good uh, uh, result with the saline test, so no regurgitation. In this movie, I saw the cone, uh, I showed the cone performance in the page where I used the septal leaflet. Stop. So here we have the true annulus and the septal leaflet is very displaced. So first we take down the anterior leaflet. Then we take the septal leaflet and make some fenestration on it. And then those are the fenestration. Then we suture the anterior leaflet to the septal leaflet. And then the posterior leaflet also to the septal leaflet. Uh, after we have the construction of that cone, we reduce the, uh, the, sept the end of the tricus valve and reposition it in the, in the right uh, position, taking care not to cause uh, heart block. So this patient was studied uh, nine years after the operation. And here you can see the septal leaflet co-opting perfectly with the anterior leaflet and no tricuspid regurgitation or stenosis. Uh, this picture is to show that uh, there is association of atrioventricular anomalous uh, connection in about 50% of the, the patient. Actually, we can see tissues crossing uh, the atrioventricular uh, line, uh, the annulus. Uh, in ABC anomaly. That happened about 50% because of arrhythmia. And also uh, the, the, the AV node is a little bit more on the right in ABC anomaly, according to that study. So in this case, we see here the tendon of Todaro, the 
aging node around here, and there's a coronary sign. So we tried to reposition the valve in following this bottle line, this dotted line, uh, a little supra annular, like you see here, to prevent uh, heart block. And we do this whenever it's possible. Regarding uh, the, yes, the closure, in this PFO, we typically put one single stitch uh, in, this, uh, in the most posterior part of the septum, uh, the primal septum, and then we, we bring it under. We, we, we make the valve mechanism for the for our valve. Here I am showing the ablation of the abnormal conduction system, and also do ablation of the uh, tricuspid cable uh, isthmus to prevent uh, arrhythmias. Here is the annulus. So I try to ablate all those abnormal tissue that could cause uh, arrhythmia. It is oriented by our uh, electrophysiologist team. This is a case long term after the operation, show a good coaptation of the tricuspid valve. And this uh, graph shows that uh, the first 54 patients uh, that who had preoperatively uh, important tricuspid regurgitation, then was improved with the, the, the column technique and that result was maintained over the time. This is a case that was done before a Carpentier technique repair. So it was working well at the beginning, but then the, the girl who was um, five years old and she had the operation, she has grown, she had grown, and then uh, the valve uh, became more distant from the septum and, and acquired regurgitation, severe regurgitation. So we reoperate on this patient. So you see here that uh, after the Carpentier repair, the valve, uh, there's no valve in the septal area. And there's a little cleft here between the anterior and the inferior leaf valve. So after the cone, you see now that the septal area, there's tissues. And then when you put saline inside the saline solution inside the heart, you see the valve closing perfectly. I will uh, show our results here at the Children's House for Pittsburgh. We, we did now, we treated 36 patients and did 35 con. So we did some innovation by doing uh, the con repair of the STARN procedure and also addressing very complicated anatomical uh, case. And, and we didn't have any mortality in this initial experience. And also we, we had the excellent quality uh, team here to, to address those patients. And we tried to offer treatment to everyone. Uh, and some of them uh, came and required the first treatment was ECMO. So other issues that other important information that some of them had gland preoperatively. So basically we tried to offer uh, treatment for everyone and we had the uh, replace one valve one year after the operation. This uh, Kapramayer uh, curves compare the patient that, uh, uh, the first 200 patient that we operate the under 12 years old and older than 12 years. Mm -hmm. And there's a significant uh, difference in results. So, under 12 years of age, none of them died, either in the operation or later, uh, as compared to the older patients. So we conclude that the cone procedure can be performed in nearly all anatomic variation abs normally with low um, risk. The tricus regurgitation repair is achieved in the cone technique is effective and durable in majority of the patients. The procedure restores the functional volume and may lead to reverse remodel of the heart in most patients. 
Our data suggests that the COM procedure may result in better clinical outcome when performed at the young age. Thank you. My name is uh, Lee Bierman, um, Pediatric Electrophysiology at Children's Hospital. And I'm uh, introducing our next speaker, Dr. Gaurav Arora, who is Associate Professor of Pediatrics, uh, Associate uh, Vice Chair of Pediatrics uh, for Clinical Affairs and Ambulatory Care. But his true passion is electrophysiology. And it's been uh, a real pleasure for me to work with him over the last 15 years as uh, almost 15 years as Associate Director of Electrophysiology. Dr. Rohr is a great clinician, uh, mentor, teacher, and researcher. He is uh, interested in uh, Wolf Parkinson White and has made some important discoveries. And he's going to address the uh, very challenging arrhythmia substrate in Epstein's anomaly. I think he is. See, uh, uh, thank you, Lee, and thank you, Victor, and thank you to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today about arrhythmias and Epstein's anomaly diagnosis and management. Our objectives today will be to discuss the basic electrophysiologic anatomy in patients with Epstein's to understand the common arrhythmias that are associated with Epstein's anomaly, uh, understand preoperative management options and strategies, and discuss transcatheter and surgical ablation techniques. So in this netter diagram, we have our usual hallmarks of the cardiac conduction system with the sinus node located in the superior right atrium, atrial conduction tracts coursing through the right atrium down to the inferior septal location in the triangle of coke of the AV node, uh, followed by the his bundle and infrahissian conduction system. Uh, and also take note of the cavo tricuspid isthmus, the distance from the inferior vena cava to the uh, tricuspid valve leaflet, which is often the substrate for macro reentrant atrial flutter. In Epstein's anomaly, the sinus node is in the usual location in the superior right atrium, but in many of these patients, atrial dilation increases the atrial conduction time. Uh, the AV node, uh, by and large, is in the usual location uh, in the triangle of Coke, uh, as Dr. De Silva described in the prior talk. Um, and infrahissian conduction is often delayed due to distal right ventricular abnormalities and conduction time. So the basic EKG findings in patients with Epstein's are the presence of right atrial enlargement as there is an increased vector from where the sinus node is anatomically located down through the atrium. There is typically a prolonged PR interval, but it's important to note this is, not, this is related to increased intraatrial conduction time and not truly related to underlying AV node disease or AV node dysfunction. There is typically RV conduction delay of some kind, either an incomplete right bundle branch block or right bundle branch block. And if right ventricular delay is not seen on the electrocardiogram, one should look really carefully whether this is a manifestation of pre-excitation because it can be very subtle and not as obvious as other cases. The arrhythmia this, arrhythmias that are typically associated with Epstein's include atrial arrhythmias, supraventricular tachycardia or SVT, Wolf Parkinson White or WPW syndrome, and ventricular tachycardia or VT. Atrial arrhythmias occur in 33 to 60% of patients with Epstein's. Atrial tachycardia is typically related to atrial dilation and abnormal hemodynamics. Atrial flutter is a macro reentrant arrhythmia, so a large reentrant circuit within the atrium and often anatomically involves the cavo tricuspid isthmus or CTI dependence. And atrial fibrillation can occur in these patients and is typically related to a progressive left atrial substrate. 
This is an ECG with a typical appearance of atrial flutter. Notice on the rhythm strip at the bottom, the classic sawtooth appearance of the rapid atrial movement with variable AV conduction. This is an adolescent with atrial fibrillation. And again, notice the classic EKG hallmarks of an irregularly irregular rhythm with no obvious or discrete P waves in the baseline. Supraventricular tachycardia can occur in patients with Epstein's. The most common is accessory pathway tachycardia or what is referred to as ORT or orthodromic reciprocating tachycardia using accessory pathway. The pathway can conduct retrograde only, in which case we call it a concealed accessory pathway, or it can be manifest, which is what we call WPW, meaning that it conducts both antegrade so that we can see it on an EKG, and then the retrograde conduction across that pathway would be responsible for the narrow complex SVT, as I'll show you on the next slide. Patients can also have AV node reentry tachycardia. And so for patients who have supraventricular arrhythmias in Epstein's, one cannot assume that it is always related to a pathway. This is a schematic of SVT using an accessory pathway. Here's the sinus node, atrium, ventricles, AV node, his bundle, his Purkinje system. The typical tachycardia would go integrate across the AV node down the his Purkinje system into the ventricle. Here's the accessory pathway in the right lateral location, retrograde up this pathway, creating ORT. To contrast, SVT due to AV node reentry tachycardia would be here sinus node, AV node, his Purkinje. And the circuit in AV node reentry tachycardia is typically a circuit around the mouth of the AV node itself with passive activation of the atrium and the ventricle. And this is something we would distinguish in the EP lab at the time of EP study. WPW in Epstein's anomaly is a known common uh, association. Um, the WPW or integrated accessory pathway occurs in 10 to 20% of patients with Epstein's anomaly. Uh, these patients are much more likely to have multiple accessory pathways, and therefore they are typically more difficult ablations than those ablations in patients with structurally normal hearts. And the accessory pathways are typically located at the usual atrioventricular annulus, so not at necessarily at the site where the tricuspid valve is, but rather at the typical atrioventricular annulus. This is a sample ECG of a young patient with WPW. Notice the classic EKG findings of short PR, wide QRS, and delta wave. This ECG has late transition, suggesting a right-sided accessory pathway, as would be seen typically in patients with Epstein's. Ventricular tachycardia can certainly occur in patients with Epstein's, and this can be related to the underlying substrate itself. And a recent paper from Multicenter Collaborative looked at the idea that the amount of atrialized right ventricle that is native has some implication as to the ventricular tachycardia substrate. It can be related to postoperative scar and something that must be kept in mind for the patients who are postoperative. And certainly this ventricular tachycardia contributes to sudden death risk. Though there's no uniform agreed upon criteria for how we do sudden cardiac death risk assessment in this population, whether it be preoperative or postoperative. The substrates I think about as an electrophysiologist for sudden death risk uh, include WPW, which can be associated with rapid integrate conduction across the pathway during atrial arrhythmias and precipitate ventricular fibrillation. The possibility of AV block, thankfully or with cone repair, that is rare, but late AV block would be a risk. And then ventricular tachycardia, native VT or post-surgical scar VT. In the literature, one of the um, Largest papers looking at sudden death risk was this experience published in 2018 from the Mayo Clinic. They looked at their cohort over four decades and looked at almost 1,000 patients, largely an adult population, 80% with severe Epstein's and about 20% with accessory pathways. And the risk factors they published were prior VT, which would certainly make sense that the presence of known ventricular tachycardia would contribute to sudden death. Clinical heart failure in these patients. Um, I don't think that we would extrapolate this to our young patients who have symptomatic Epstein's as we have seen because that's, I don't believe the same pathophysiology. The presence of prior syncope, which uh, we would all agree is a concern for the presence of a dangerous arrhythmia. The presence of pulmonary stenosis or the presence of polycythemia indicating chronic cyanosis. 
Um, this is one of the few papers in the literature about how, what sudden death risk factors we should be following. Uh, but as I mentioned, I don't think there's uniform agreement in this population as how to risk stratify them for the purpose of placing a primary prophylaxis ICD. Preoperative electrophysiology study or EPS is certainly a discussion in these patients. Uh, there are groups that have published and advocate doing a preoperative EP study for all patients undergoing cone repair. Um, but in speaking to people, I think many others, including us here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh of UPMC, perform preoperative EP study in select patients based on their arrhythmia history. So either a history of SVT, WPW, or VT, or symptoms suggestive of an arrhythmia, suspicious palpitations, or clinical syncope not otherwise explained. When doing ablations in WPW for these patients, accessory pathway ablation is certainly more difficult in the presence of Epstein. It is common for these patients to have multiple accessory pathways ranging from six to 36%. The electrograms in the EP study are often very fractionated in the atrium, which makes interpretation difficult. Uh, and the most common locations for these pathways are right posteroseptal, right posterior and posterolateral, or as one would imagine, along the inferior margin where the largest amount of tricuspid valve abnormality is found. As I mentioned, the accessory pathways are typically located at the usual annular location. So one strategy that has been employed is to consider locating the right coronary artery or the right AV groove. And this can be done either with an angiogram during the case, use of a coronary wire into the right coronary, or a small mapping catheter, such as a two or three French mapping catheter uh, to assist in annular location at that time. And recently, there's been an interest in using mapping with high density catheters to facilitate accessory pathway location as well and help us understand where the true annular, annular signals might be found. Surgical ablation absolutely is part of the discussion and should be uh, considered in patients for whom it's appropriate. Um, we should consider right atrial maze for patients who have no natural tachycardia or macro reentrant atrial flutter demonstrated. For patients with atrial arrhythmias and right atrial tachycardias, atrial debulking, I believe, plays an important role in helping to improve the hemodynamics and reduce the atrial stretch that leads to atrial tachycardia. You consider a left atrial maze for patients with documented atrial fibrillation. And surgical accessory pathway ablation, as Dr. DeSova showed in his last case, is very useful if transcatheter accessory pathway location is unsuccessful. Cable tricuspid isthmus ablation. Um, the CTI may be more difficult to anatomically access after surgery based on where the septal leaflet is placed back. And so, one thing to discuss is whether if a, if a linear probe allows for a fully transmural CTI ablation line, one could consider empiric CTI ablation line for all patients as part of a cone procedure to prevent future isthmus-dependent atrial flutter. I think this could be done safely with low risk of atrioventricular block given the CTI location and the ability to place that line lateral to the septum and far away from the AV node. Uh, and I think the key features would be um, the ability to deliver a fully transmural lesion with a linear probe, uh, but having the CTI exposed prior to reinsertion of the leaflet uh, is an advantage. In summary, Arrhythmias are relatively common in patients with Epstein's anomaly, and I think that um, uh, arrhythmia assessment is an important part of preoperative strategy. Preoperative arrhythmia identification aids in pre-op EP study planning and ablation, uh, surgical planning with maze or CTI line, uh, and sudden death risk assessment. Um, consider a preoperative EP study for patients with known history of arrhythmias or symptoms suggestive of an arrhythmia. Transcatheter ablations for SVT substrates or hemodynamically stable VT substrates that could be mapped and considered CTI ablation as a routine part of comb procedure, uh, at least worth discussing. Thank you. Well, uh, as many of us know, not all Epstein's uh, anomalies are the same, and each patient is unique. And as it's been described by echo, uh, MRI, CT, 
Uh, we have some relatively straightforward, what we would consider straightforward Epstein's anomalies, and we have uh, certainly more complex ones. And I'll have to say that five years ago, uh, before Pedro and Luciana joined us, I felt that most Epstein's anomaly were complex. And uh, I always felt extremely frustrated with the outcome of the surgeries because it was inconsistent and somewhat difficult and not enjoyable procedures. Uh, and I will tell you, my world has changed uh, with, uh, with the comb procedure, which is reproducible. Um, you usually end up with, with a significantly improved uh, result. Um, it's, it's a game changer. Um, clearly, it's a lot easier to do a cone on a mild uh, Epstein's anomaly. It's a different story to do it in an extremely complex one. And, but when you have a master like Jose or Luciana uh, uh, doing the operation, it, it, you see how it can be done. And like I always tell my junior surgeons, I said, you have to be a believer. And, and with the cone, you have to be a believer. It's doable, it can be done. And uh, Jose is going to go over the more complex uh, cone repairs that he's performed. Jose? Victor, thank you again for our kind presentation. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to join uh, your great team of uh, cardiac surgeons and, and cardiologists at the Heart Institute of Children's Hospital, Pittsburgh, UPMC. So the main surgical challenges in the anomaly repair are the severe tricuspid valve morphological malformation, tricuspid valve rotated, extremely rotated, say, to the right ventricular outflow tract, and severe damage to the right uh, ventricle structure. And of course, a heart failure newborn with abstinence anomaly, which Luciana is gonna uh, uh, address. So here we have a, a lady who was 40 years old, and then she started having symptoms with Epstein anomaly. The reason she had late symptoms is because she had a good structure of the, the, the right ventricle, and she had a mod, a severe, also she had severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So when we operate on her, you can see that we construct the cone easily, and there is a good support for this valve and for the right ventricle. In the right, you can see that the valve closed perfectly. And here the echo shows the good structure for the right ventricle with papillary muscles and everything, muscles and everything, uh, and a good function uh, for the new valve. And this patient also presents a relatively uh, good um, structure for the right ventricle and for the tricuspid valve. Here's the anterior wall, the inferior wall, and this is the septal wall, uh, the septal leaf, the anterior, uh, the, the anterior uh, leaflet, the inferior leaflet, and the septal leaflet. So we took down the anterior leaflet, the inferior leaflet, and then uh, made that incision here and also took it on the septal leaflet. The septal leaflet at the end became the support for the inferior leaflet. And then we had an excellent uh, result. But this patient had, uh, was 19 years old and had a, a long history of cyanosis. So here you see the tricus valve closed very nicely, good in flow, no regurgitation, but the right ventricle doesn't work so well. Uh, so I think the long, uh, expecting long term with cyanotic patients is not, uh, is not good for the recovering the RV. And here we have another patient who had uh, global dysfunction of the heart, the left ventricle dysfunction, right ventricle dysfunction, very dilated, right? ventricle and had a gap of coaptation here between the anterior, maybe inferior and septal leaflet. So because of this uh, different behavior, we did a heart catheterization. As you see here, it's a dysfunctional right ventricle, very 
important regurgitation of the tricuspid valve. And the reason for that is that she had a very dominant uh, right coronary artery, which was stretched by the right side of the heart dilation, probably caused some degree of ischemia. So this girl didn't do well at the beginning. We had placed her on ECMO for 24 hours, but then she recovered nicely. Here you see the function of the right ventricle is very reasonable, good function for the tricuspid valve. And here there's a sign of good reco recovery of the right ventricle, which is uh, the shunt, uh, the, the atrial septum is from the left uh, to the right, indicate a good function for the right ventricle. The chest X-ray preoperatively was very enlarged. Uh, the heart was very enlarged. And uh, only two days after, the heart was much smaller. And the patient really did an excellent recovery and went, and went home very early. So here is to show that it was in this paper, in this publication by Dr. Schreiber, unfortunately died young, died young, and Dr. Robert Anderson showing the different uh, situation of the abnormal angle of the tricuspid valve and abyss anomaly. Could be, the rotation could be minimal or could be very important in the valve opening toward the outflow tract of the right ventricle. So to construct a valve, to bring those tissues in this place, uh, the valve opening toward the apex of the heart is more difficult when you have extreme rotation. Uh, this patient uh, had, uh, here you can see uh, a gap of corporation between the anterior and septal leaflet with the regurgitation. And then in this view of the outflow tract of the right ventricle, you can see that the anterior leaflet opens the, toward the, the pulmonary valve, very near the pulmonary valve, and there's a regurgitation here. So we have double orifice, one near the outflow tract of the right ventricle, and the outflow tract of the right ventricle, and the other one uh, near the apex of the right ventricle. Importantly, this patient had a severe dilation of, of uh, the outflow of the right ventricle. See here, it is round and uh, is uh, in severe dysfunction. Here's the pulmonary artery. And this area should be uh, different. So it's very dilated. Uh, we did the operation. Uh, we recovered the valve. But here, the ventricle has some dysfunction. As you can see here in this cross section of the cone. Uh, and there is some dysfunction uh, of the, the heart early on, the early postoperative time, despite of a good function of the, tri the tricuspid valve. Also, this girl was young and she is doing very well clinically and, and improving the, the function. And this is specimen that uh, was shown by our colleague Bill uh, Devine today. We can see that uh, the tricuspid valve uh, is like a membrane that is very uh, tethered uh, to the anterior wall and the inferior wall, and the septal leaflet is displaced. And here you can see the opening of the tricuspid valve toward the outflow tract which you see here. And the important thing is that the outflow tract in this patient who died when he was only 14 years old of age uh, uh, was very dilated and thin walled. So here we have the same type of patient from the surgeon views. So this anterior wall is tethered to the tricuspid valve and the inferior wall as well. And there's no septal leaflet because they are rotated. And you see just this little hole that is near the pulmonary valve and with some stenosis. So this patient was six years old uh, and this part of the tricuspid valve was so tethered to the anterior wall that didn't, didn't let it dilate. So she had dilation only of the atrialized area of the ventricle. So we did the procedure, the conal procedure, 
And here you see a membranous valve with just a little hole. And here we have a cross section of the valve that closes very nicely. And the ventricle looks nice to the RV. This because she was operated early on, probably. Now, uh, this is another patient for uh, the, heart, uh, the Dante Institute of Cardiology in Brazil that they uh, have the opportunity to operate. She, uh, this girl had also a severe dysfunction of the right ventricle, severe displacement of the tricuspid valve into the outflow tract of the right ventricle, as you see in this image here. So the valve is opening here, very near the pulmonary artery, the, the pulmonary valve. And here, the, the cardiac silhouette is dilated. And, and you see that in this uh, MRI, that the anterior leaflet is very tethered uh, to the right ventricle. Uh, and, and here, the displacement toward the RV outflow tract. So this is operation. So, so the valve is very abnormal. This is the inferior leaflet. And this is the opening toward the outflow tract. The septal leaflet is minimal. So here is where we have to, to construct the apex of that valve. So we start taking down the tissues very carefully to take only uh, the leaflet and leaving the, the muscle to the to the myocard to the wall of the right vent. So Here's a, a more normal leaflet of part of the anterior leaflet. After we're done with this, there's a tendency to bulge the anterior uh, therapy. Then we go to this anterocept aspect of the tricuspid valve and mobilize it. And then we have to cut those connection to the outflow tract of the right ventricle. Now we are taking down the septal uh, leaflet, which is very abnormal. And we're gonna use it only to support part of the anterior leaflet, which we have rotated from the outflow tract to this area here. Then we reposition, we decrease the size of the end, reposition the, the valve, do some fenestration, and then we look for holes like this one, for example, between the anterior and inferior leaflet, we have to close. And then we're gonna work inside the right ventricle, getting some papillary muscles and some bridges and put together uh, to improve the morphology of the right ventricle, hoping that will be useful for preventing uh, dysfunction and ballooning of the right ventricle after this type of operation. So now we finish reposition the trichus valve and we have excellent result at the end with very good captations of the leaflet. This is uh, the echocardiograph result. You see that there's some prolapse of the valve, but the palpitation level is more in internal, uh, more distal, and uh, the valve collapses very nicely. Uh, for, uh, you see some muscle here that was taken with the leaflet that tend to thin over the years. And here's the 15 days after the operation with good um, hemodynamic valve result some dysfunction of the right vent. This is another difficult case where the patient was 10 years old with a huge uh, right vent and, and heart and right atrium. But here we have notes in this MRI that there's very thinning of the apical part of the valve has some, uh, and also in the, in the outflow tract of the right ventricle. And here you see the left ventricle that is very small and compressed by the right ventricle. So in this operation, we remove some uh, of this thin wall uh, of the right ventricle 
And so we reduce the, the size that way, and also in the outflow track of the right vent. And we did a good construction of the, the, the track as well. And she responded well. So 10 days after the operation, the heart was already smaller, mostly because of the surge common overs. But then after four years, the heart was almost normal size. And she was having some arrhythmias, atrial arrhythmias, and because of treatment, she required an atrial pacemaker. So this is the first drawing uh, with the Dr. Abstain description of the disease. And I'll tell that probably this case would be repairable in all days. So, uh, to summarize, an excellent trifles valve repair does not assure a good myocardial performance. Chronic cyanose seems to be a factor to prevent RV reverse remodeling. Good mobility of the tricus valve and tear leaflet favor good postoperative right ventricle function. Severe rotation of the tricus valve into the RVOT, linear attachment of the tricus valve leaflet and RVOT dilation seems to indicate a bad prognosis for the right event post-repair uh, post performance. Early surgical repair in cyanotic abyssin anomaly patients and in complex abyssin anomaly anatomy seems to be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aurora, Dr. Bierman, and Dr. De Silva. So we'll open up to questions again. Um, first question for Dr. De Silva: When do you perform a Glenn shunt simultaneous with the cone procedure? So the, the first question is about is the performing a Glenn simultaneous with the cone. All right, okay. When um, normally in the Abyssin anomaly, uh, we, we leave a type of pop off um, uh, defect in the septum, uh, the, the atrial, atrial septal level, because very frequently the patient develops heart failure, dysfunction of the right, and the early postoperative care. When the right event is so big the, in the beginning, and you know that the, the result of the operation will be not very good, there will be severe dysfunction. So in those cases, we plan to do the Glenn procedure at the operation. The reason for that is because it's the Glenn operation, you can unload the right ventricle and give more chance for its recovery. So uh, that would be uh, an indication. And also postoperatively, if the patient's not doing well, and they are, then uh, this could be very helpful. Uh, the other thing that I would comment that uh, in Abyssin anomaly, when they don't do well after the operation, you have to be very uh, quick indicating ECMO. Because in the older time when we didn't have that resource, we, we we delayed the indication and then they developed irre irreversible shock. So if you want to recover the patient, you have to be very aggressive using ECMO if you have any doubt about the, uh, the, the heart function and the patient's developed low cardiac output. Okay. Next question also for Dr. De Silva. So what do you consider the best weight or age to get the surgery? Yeah, this is, is a tough question because it depends. If you want to, to do routinely, I think three to five years would be good to manage the patient. But if the patient is cyanotic, I, I will do it between six months and a year. If the patient has a very complicated uh, 
anatomy and you start dilating the outflow tract. Because this is something that can be misleading because uh, the, the tissue are displaced around uh, in, in, inside the ventricle, if very attached to the anterior and sometimes to the inferior wall. So that area of the ventricle does not dilate because it's supported by those valves tissues, but they are very thin. Uh, and then when they start, so the, if they have regurgitation, there's a tendency to dilate more the outflow tract of the right ventricle. So if that's starting to happen, you have to do the operation soon. So if you have severe cyanosis, then you have to do early on. I prefer to do between six months and one year. Now, if you have a more favorable anatomy, and then you, you don't have, you don't hurry to do, but I prefer to do uh, before they get to be teenagers, especially in the girls, because uh, then they have to, they will grow. They have still the potential to grow. And, and that helps to improve the, the result of the cone operation. So it's kind of a complex decision, I would say, but if the patient is cyanotic, you have to do it as soon as possible. And also it has a complex anatomy. Uh, when you take down the leaflet, the heart will dilate. And if you have a younger patient, they have the potential to grow, they will improve over, the time, over time and have more chance of having normal function. I, I was really surprised when I saw studies of older patients of mine, and some of them with a perfect valve and perfect repair, but still the RV uh, was not uh, working so well with severe dysfunction, even though most of those patients were, uh, didn't have any symptoms. But I am worried about the long, the long uh, term follow up result on those patients. And now an even tougher question. So how are your experiences of a cone repair after a Carpentier or a Danielson repair? Well, I have, I have had the experience only when two Carpentier repairs, but I have done a cone repair even after prosthesis uh, of tricuspid replacement as far as you have tissues down there. So if you have tissues, we still can uh, repair. When you have, you don't have enough tissue, you stay, uh, then you, uh, you can, rep I recommend nowadays, special nowadays, to, to add some tissue, some pericardium. In younger patients, they use like flash pericardium. In a little older patient, we use uh, glucose hydrated treated pericardium. So basically, you, it's not difficult to do. You can do it, uh, especially after Carpentier, because half of the work is, is already done. So all depends how much tissue you have. This is for Dr. Aurora and Dr. Bierman. Why do a right atrial maze for a flutter, but left atrial maze for atrial fibrillation? So what I would say in the preoperative patient is that atrial flutter is generally a right atrial abnormality. And the circuits typically, uh, they often in the preoperative patient will involve the CTI as a, we discussed, uh, but really we sort of, we consider atrial flutter to largely be a right atrial substrate. Atrial fibrillation comes from pulmonary vein triggers in the left atrium. And so for uh, atrial fibrillation uh, in someone with a structurally normal heart, the standard transcatheter therapy is pulmonary vein isolation or PVI. Um, and that analogy would extend to our congenital heart patients where once uh, the disease progresses and they get AF, then uh, I think a left atrial maze or PBI is the therapy of choice for that substrate. And if your ablation techniques don't work and the patient still has a high risk of sudden death related to VT or progression to possibly VF, would you consider ICD implantation? Um, absolutely, yes. For patients who have known VT um, or, uh, his, or VF, uh, then absolutely an ICD is indicated. Um, in this patient population, you'd have three choices. Uh, one would be placement of a standard transvenous ICD, but that means you have to go across that repaired valve, so that's a challenge we would uh, navigate. Uh, the second is placement of an epicardial ICD system, which is off-label use of the current um, uh, system. 
equipment that's out there, but certainly it's been reported and well done and we've done it ourselves in this institution. Uh, and then a current uh, newer technology in the last few years is the av availability of the subcutaneous ICD for patients who are large enough that we can do that where we avoid the transvenous space. But and the short answer to the question is yes, for patients who truly have ventricular arrhythmias, they absolutely would meet a class one indication for an ICD. I think the challenge as I alluded to in my talk is simply um, how do we identify those patients who might be at risk for ventricular arrhythmias? Is it, it remains a challenge for all of us to pick those patients correctly. And then, Dr. De Silva, do you always placate the atrialized right ventricle? Dr. Del Nido once said he believed the placation can cause post-op cardiac arrhythmias. Well, uh, this is interesting to think rationally about that. If you need to placate uh, too much, I, I normally I placate small areas and on the scene wall and with only uh, endocardial suture. But when you, you see that you have patient big atrium, you have a possibility of arrhythmia, you have to try to isolate that area electorally. Otherwise, you cannot come back to it. And the other issue that you have to be careful is about causing ischemia in that area because the ischemia can be a cause for arrhythmia in the future. Uh, so you have to be very careful about, the, about that exclusion. Now, when you have especially uh, small patients, normally I don't do plication like, uh, I mean, the classical plication. What I do, I put sutures, isolated sutures. Then you can have access to treat arrhythmia. And also in young patients, they can, um, they can develop from myocardium in that area as it grows. Uh, so I don't always placate um, classically, but always put sutures to decrease the area of the, uh, of the RV's uh, uh, functional shunt, uh, uh, chamber after the coma. Should all patients have a pre-op EP study or is there a minimal age for this in this group? Yeah, I don't think that there is a, <clears throat> a minimal age. I think any, we generally do any indication of arrhythmias, whether it's symptoms, certainly the presence of WPW, I think is an indication for it. Uh, if a child does not have uh, any arrhythmias, symptoms suggesting that, or any abnormalities on the EKG other than a right bundle branch block, I don't think we would do it uh, for that. But if there's any indication, there's no age limitation to it. Um, Dr. De Silva, for adults with Epstein's, are there any criteria you would use to not offer the cone? Okay, well, uh, I always use the, the cone. So in my view, there is no criteria, but I would say if you have a, a very bad anatomy and that we have to put more tissues in the valve to construct the cone, it'll be very complicated. I think in, in patients that over 30 or 40 years of age, you can uh, do re plan for a replacement. Uh, but I haven't had uh, the opportunity to do this, except in a lady that she asked to do replacement to make the operation shorter, as the Dr. Luciana has mentioned. How do you think of 40-year-old Epstein's with severe anatomic abnormality, including marked valve displacement into the RVOT and small LV, but only mild to moderate TR and no right to left shunt and doing well? I didn't get this. So in a patient that's 40 years old with Epstein's right. and has a severe anatomic abnormality, with marked valve displacement, but only mild to moderate um, TR and no right to left shunting. Would you proceed, would you offer a cone or do you think that that's the right option? Yeah, this, this is an excellent question. Yeah, this you have to do the stress test, you have to follow very well, but might not be a candidate for surgery. Maybe you can go on with a medical treatment. We, but normally you have to do the operation because it's very, rare to, be a, to see a patient with typical epsi anomaly uh, over the year 70. Uh, I saw only one case and the patient had a problem in the left ventricle as well. So the only thing we could done was medical treatment. Okay. 
So we're going to close the discussion for now. Don't worry, a lot of your questions will be answered. Not If they're not answered live, we will get to your answers eventually. And next up, we have Aaron Colvin, most likely with an ins another inspiring story for us. Hi, everybody. As we prepare for our next group of talks on fetal and neonatal Epstein's, I want you guys to enjoy this um, short video, uh, Kason Smith and her family and their journey through their neonatal um, Epstein's treatment. Hi, this is Kaysen and my name's Michaela. We found out that Kaysen had Epstein's at her 20 week gestational scan. After we heard from the children's doctors um, that, yeah. we, that they didn't have much that they could do. It's pretty hard to hear when they just kind of tell us that they'll keep her comfortable when she's born. My sister is actually the one who found Dr. De Silva and read about him and Silva. saw that he created the cone procedure and that he specializes in Epstein's. We were relieved to see that somebody knows something about what she has. When they got back to us, Dr. De Silva actually called us and said, I can fix her. And when he said that, we packed our bags and we moved across the country to Pittsburgh. Um, we moved 24 hours away from our hometown two weeks before Kaysen was born. It was a rough journey to move when you're about to give birth to in a new city. It was chaotic for a long time. Once we were there, we felt a sense of relief. Um, Kaysen was born. She was very sick in the beginning. It was a rough time for a while, but we were just so blessed to be able to find a team that could do something and intervene and that could save our life. We were just so blessed <laughs> that we were able to find mm. Pittsburgh and the whole UPMC cardiac team and it's just amazing what they can do and we're just so relieved and happy that they're trying to spread more info out there to other people. It's a really great thing and we're very happy. Um, Kaysen is just wild woman now. You would never ever expect that she was ever so sick in the beginning. It's amazing. We're so blessed and we love all the, the whole team that helped us get to where we are today. Can you say, say, we're thankful. So the Heart Institute at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh wants to thank the Congenital Heart Academy for their collaboration with today's events. With their help, we've registered, we have registered participants from all over the globe. Um, following here is just a brief video of, about the Congenital Heart Academy and what the, they do. And following this, we'll have just a five minute intermission. everybody, welcome to Congenital Heart Academy. I'm Dr. Grace Monlewan from Sidra Medicine, Qatar, and I'm glad to give you a quick overview about us. We'd like to thank UPNC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh for the opportunity to support and broadcast the Da Silva Center for Edison Anomaly Symposium. The Congenital Heart Academy was founded by Dr. Gil Vernovsky from Children's National, Washington, DC, and Dr. Sasha Gatti, from Bambino Gesù in Italy. Dr. Sasha and myself are the co-chairs. We have the great support of more than 60 delegates from all around the world. Congenital Heart Academy is a web-based educational platform. 
dedicated to worldwide healthcare providers involved with congenital heart diseases, sharing high-quality scientific knowledge and experience in a spirit of collaboration and union among the multidisciplinary team all around the world engaged in the care of patients with congenital or acquired heart defects from the fetal life through adulthood. We aim to reach every member of the, of the multidisciplinary team worldwide, continuously de uh, delivering high-level education, ultimately helping to improve team collaboration and patient care. Since the pandemic began, the Congenital Heart Academy has put on more than 90 free webinars with 16,000 unique participants and 125 countries represented. More than 100 outstanding speakers have shared their knowledge and expertise. We've collaborated with several societies, including Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society, Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society, the Society of Pediatric Cardiology Training Program Directors, Saudi Heart Association, and uh, CENOC, Fetal Heart Golf Group and the Caspian Heart Foundation. Eight webinars have been in Italian and eight and two in Spanish. In addition to the webinars, we have several series, including Dr. Robert Anderson's morphological series, where we discuss one cardiac disease each Friday, Dr. Norman, Norman Silverman's correlation of echo images and morphology once a month, Dr. Mary Cohen amazing echo series and fetal cardiology series. Dr. Gilvernovsky has his own series as well, debating all hot topics in pediatric cardiac intensive care and much more. In addition, Congenital Heart Academy is a collaborator of the 8th World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery, planning to showcase the content created for the 2023 World Congress in a virtual fashion. All content from Congenital Heart Academy is free and allows participants to join on the Zoom platform, platform interacting with the faculty on the Q&A chat box, polls, etc. and is broadcasted live on YouTube. The Congenital Heart Academy YouTube channel keeps all talks free for watching later as well. Please follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Invite your team and join us on our future meetings. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you more about Congenital Heart Academy.
Good morning. I'm Dr. Justin Ye, the Chief of Cardiac Intensive Care here at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. I'd just like to extend a thanks again to the Congenital Heart Academy for their assistance with this symposium today. And certainly we'd like all of us as presenters to extend our thanks to the families who have shared their stories with us this morning. They're, they certainly inspire us to uh, push the science of the field forward and to give us the courage to have the belief, as Dr. Merrill alluded to earlier, to uh, face uh, some of the dire circumstances we see with some of our patients when they're at their most critical point. In this section today, we'll be talking about uh, the transition from fetal care to care in the cardiac ICU and surgical management of neonates with Epstein's anomaly. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Johnson uh, as our next speaker. She's an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Cardiology here at the University of Pittsburgh and Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She is the director of perinatal cardiology, and she will be discussing fetal diagnosis gestational management, and childbirth planning. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to the organizers, and thank you to Luciana and Jose for allowing me to do this talk today. So we are going to discuss the fetal diagnosis and management and delivery planning of patients with Epstein's anomaly. Um, as we've been talking about, Epstein's is a rare congenital anomaly um, and um, is seen in about 0.5% of all congenital heart disease lesions. It has a broad, broad morphological spectrum and is made up of three main characteristics that we've been discussing. The nice part about this is that due to the insufficiency of the tricuspid valve, the RA and the tricuspid valve annulus is dilated, so these patients are easily picked up um, and identified by um, OB ultrasound done in about 18, 20 weeks of gestation. So we get to see a lot of these patients uh, prenatally, which has been great. So why is fetal diagnosis of Epstein's anomaly important? Well, as infants with Epstein's anomaly remains um, one of the most difficult congenital heart diseases to manage postnatally. Fetuses with severe tricuspid valve insufficiency are at risk for cardiomegaly, high drops, arrhythmias, and even fetal demise. In the 2015 multicenter study by Freud et al., uh, the perinatal mortal mortality for this cohort was up to 45%, which is significantly higher than other lesions in the current era. So research, research has been focused on trying to determine the fetal echocardiogram characteristics that put these patients at greatest risk for poor outcome. This venture has been difficult since it's been shown that the hemodynamic state of a fetus with Epstein's anomaly um, can evolve over pregnancy. In the... Uh, in the study done by Turney et al. in 2017, fetuses with favorable hemodynamics early in pregnancy um, often became unfavorable, unfavorable hemodynamics by third trimester. So making the surveillance of these patients um, very challenging for fetal cardiologists. So the identification of poor outcome, um, what do fetal cardiologists look for? What are our sort of triggers? So in the study in 2015, um, they showed that diagnosis of fetal um, uh, Epstein's anomaly uh, before 32 weeks of gestation was a risk for poor outcome. They thought this was due to more severe disease being diagnosed by OB ultrasounds earlier um, in pregnancy. And in both multi-center studies, they showed that dilation of the tricuspid valve annulus um, showing an increased Z-score um, was associated with poor Epstein's outcome. The thoughts behind this is that these findings of tricuspid valve dilation correlate to the degree of the amount of tricuspid valve insufficiency, right atrial enlargement, and overall uh, cardiomegaly. The reason why right-sided dilation is important is because it can lead to inadequate systemic cardiac output. Um, in two ways. So the overall compression of the left ventricle um, leading to decreased systemic output. And then it's also been shown that the severe dilation of the right atrium causes distortion of the PFO, therefore affecting and altering the right to left shunting across the PFO and decreasing the left ventricular preload. <clears throat> 
Another major marker that I think most people look for and we're always hunting for is pulmonary valve insufficiency because it's um, concerning for the ability to set up for a circular shunt. In the 2017 multi-center study, um, they showed that pulmonary valve insufficiency was the most powerful indicator for poor outcome for these patients. Other markers of fetal distress, pericardial effusions, and then um, sort of looking, I think a lot of papers are now looking at tricuspid valve insufficiency velocity, sort of as a surrogate to right ventricular function. Um, and those are also things that uh, we like to trend and look for. So what are the things that um, we are evaluating in fetal cardiology um, for these patients that come to us with Epstein's anomaly? Well, we obviously look at the tricuspid valve, um, the anatomy, the annulus diameter, what is the Z-score, um, looking at the severity of regurgitation, um, also the uh, peak regurgitation um, gradient is also helpful, helpful for us when dealing with planning. Pulmonary valve, what is the annulus diameter? What is the Z-score? Um, is there antegrade flow through the pulmonary valve? Is there now pulmonary valve atresia? And then also very significantly pulmonary valve insufficiency. Is there any concern for pulmonary valve insufficiency? Uh, ductus arteriosus, is there antegrade or retrograde flow? Uh, what are the ventricles doing? Right ventricle, left ventricle, width, length, Z-scores? What is the stolic function? cardiothoracic area ratios, the evidence of high drops, and cardiovascular profile scores. So what we look at is we look at each individual patient. We try to determine the severity of the Epstein's uh, anomaly and then their risk factors for poor outcome. And after looking at that, we sort of determine uh, what are fetal surveillances. Um, for patients that are doing well, no pulmonary atresia, no pulmonary valve insufficiency, those patients might be seen every four weeks. But any patient who starts developing new onset pulmonary atresia or any pulmonary valve insufficiency, we tend to see those patients more often at one to two weeks. So how we sort of divide up um, our patients and try to determine delivery planning. So as we've talked about, the severity of Epstein's can change throughout pregnancy. So this is a uh, multidisciplinary team decision. So in our department, we talk with pediatric cardiology, cardiac ICU, NICU, maternal fetal medicine, cardiac surgery. And for our department, the transport team is also very important. Our delivery hospital is two miles away um, from the children's hospital. So they are also taken in consideration when delivering these high-risk patients. So for us, we mostly deliver these patients in the tertiary care center. Um, we sort of divide them into three groups and sort of look at um, based on their pulmonary valve flow. So group one are those patients with moderate to severe tricuspid valve insufficiency, and they have antegrade flow through their pulmonary valve. And the, P, or the tricuspid valve insufficiency peak systolic gradient is greater than 50% of gestational age. Those patients um, usually are able to be supported by oxygen if they have low saturations after delivery. Group two is that group of patients with pulmonary atresia who's had pulmonary atresia throughout their pregnancy um, and uh, they have no evidence of um, pulmonary valve insufficiency. Um, these patients uh, usually there's you know, um, for at least transport, we, we put them on prostaglandins um, for the transport from the women's hospital to children's hospital. And then group three, that's our uh, fun and interesting group that always keeps me on my toes. So that, that is the group with pulmonary atresia and pulmonary valve insufficiency. And we sort of look at those all together and sort of determine where best these patients can deliver. Um, right now, we're looking at those patients with RV systolic pressures greater than 50% and pulmonary valve insufficiency, hoping that um, these are the patients that would have the best chance of the pulmonary valve opening. And these are patients that we are not putting on prostaglandins for transportation um, in hopes not to um, worsen a circular shunt. And then there's those patients with the lower um, RV systolic pressures. Those patients, um, we have prostaglandins on standby for the delivery just in case um, oxygen um, is not uh, something, if we need a little bit more than oxygen. Also, we have epinephrine um, ready for these patients because sometimes the left ventricular function is poor.
There's also those fetuses with concern for significant hemodynamic compromise uh, due to their circular shunt in utero. These patients can be, sitter, can be considered for non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. We will not review this uh, type of patient in today's discussion. So we'll go over a couple cases that we've had. Um, case one is a patient of mine who um, had a normal second trimester OB ultrasound and then moved to the Pennsylvania area. Um, they had they established care with a local OB office, which showed a dilated right atrium and inner uterine growth restriction. Um, a fetal echocardiogram was uh, performed at 36 weeks of gestation, uh, which showed uh, severe tricuspid valve insufficiency, a tricuspid annulus, upper limits of normal, a CTA ratio of 0.4, so cardiomegaly, uh, RA dilation, and there's antegrade flow across the pulmonary valve. And the RV systolic pressure was 30 at 36 weeks, so a nice um, RV pressure. So here, as you can see in this image, the right atrium is dilated and you can see the tethering of both the septal and anterior leaflets um, in this 2D image. Now looking at color, you can see the um, apically displaced color jet starting here, a lower in the ventricle that rises all the way to the right atrium. So we consider this severe insufficiency. So, when discussing this patient, we had her come down to the tertiary center here in Pittsburgh to deliver. She had severe insufficiency, cardiomegaly, IUGR. So it was delivered here in Pittsburgh. Since there was antegrade flow across the pulmonary valve um, and the TR systolic gradient was uh, greater than 50% of gestational age at 33 millimeters of mercury, no prostaglandins um, were, are, were not needed for transport. So how did this patient do? Um, she delivered, oxygen saturations were 96%. She was transferred to the Children's Hospital with severe tricuspid valve insufficiency. She was in the NICU for about seven days and discharged home with moderate tricuspid valve insufficiency. She's currently followed in my clinic and we are determining a cone repair timing for her. So she's overall growing and doing well. Case two, so this is a patient who was sent to us because of right-sided dilatation and also a father of the baby had transposition of the great arteries. So this patient was sent to us at 27 weeks. The tricuspid valve Z-score was uh, four, so enlarged, severe tricuspid valve insufficiency. And this patient had pulmonary atresia with no pulmonary valve insufficiency, uh, retrograde flow across the ductus arteriosus. Uh, cardiomegaly, severe dilation of the RARV, and had a lower um, peak tricuspid valve insufficiency gradient 18. So this patient was again seen four weeks later, no real change in the pulmonary valve because that's what we're, um, we're looking at. So still pulmonary atresia, no pulmonary valve insufficiency, um, and the, there's retrograde flow in the patent ductus arteriosus. Turning our attention to the tricuspid valve um, regurgitation gradient, again, it was still low um, at 17 and wasn't increasing with gestational age. So this patient was again seen prior to delivery at 37 weeks, no changes, pulmonary atresia, no pulmonary valve insufficiency, retrograde flow in the ductus arteriosus. And again, the peak uh, tricuspid valve insufficiency gradient was 16, so on the lower side. So as you can see here, there's severe right atrial enlargement. There is a septal and anterior tethering of both the valves. And you can see again, apically dis displaced tricuspid valve insufficiency that goes all the way to the right atrium. So severe tricuspid valve insufficiency. And then again, as we talked about, we're always looking at the pulmonary valve. So pulmonary valve atresia, we don't really see much leaflet movement. You don't see any pulmonary valve insufficiency and you see retrograde flow in the ductus arteriosus. So for this patient, again, delivery at a tertiary center. For this patient, because there was pulmonary atresia and no pulmonary valve insufficiency and has been that way um, since about second trimester and the tricuspid valve insufficiency gradient was low, the decision was to put the patient on prostaglandins for transport. Post-delivery, this patient had saturations less than 75%, so was intubated and transferred to the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Just to show um, how tenuous these children are, um, this patient developed incessant ectopic atrial tachycardia 
within the first 12 hours of life and became hemodynamically unstable. They were placed on ECMO cannulation and then underwent a STARNS procedure at day two of life. Um, patient was monitored and then by six months of life, they underwent a STARNS takedown and uh, cone repair and monoclast pulmonary valve repair um, and is currently at home. So the last two cases are the challenging ones that um, we're always wondering what to do. So this is another patient um, from the area who just came in because they had dilation of the right atrium um, and uh, came to our office at 26 weeks. The tricuspid valve Z-score was two, moderate tricuspid valve insufficiency, a nice tricuspid valve gradient of 27 millimeters of mercury and anterograde flow through the pulmonary valve. This patient came back um, uh, three weeks later. And uh, as we talked about, things can change, things can evolve during pregnancy. So just three weeks later, and there's now pulmonary atresia and there's pulmonary valve insufficiency. There's retrograde flow through the ductus arteriosus, no evidence of high drops. So once we see changes in um, uh, changes to pulmonary atresia or pulmonary insufficiency, um, our MFM team starts doing biophysical profiles more often to monitor for growth and any signs of distress. Unfortunately, at around 34 weeks of gestation, the patient came in for a biophysical, pro a routine biophysical profile and was known to have abdominal ascites and end diastolic umbilical flow um, in their umbilical arteries, as you can see here um, on the Doppler patterns. So repeat fetal echocardiogram showed worsening of the pulmonary valve insufficiency. The TR gradient was 32 millimeters in mercury at 35 or 34 weeks of life. So we are really hopeful that um, hope, you know, that the pulmonary valve may open. So this patient was admitted um, to the hospital. Mother was admitted over hospital for monitoring. Um, unfortunately, the infant, the fetus had multiple episodes of bradycardia, so it was delivered uh, the next day. Here you can see in their fetal echocardiogram, here's the right atrial enlargement. You can see how tethered the septal leaflet and is especially the anterior leaflet really displacing that uh, functional annulus. So again, severe tricuspid valve insufficiency goes all the way up to the top of the right atrium. And again, looking at the pulmonary valve, so here's your pulmonary valve. You really don't see um, much movement. Um, you can see here the retrograde flow through the patent ductus arteriosus. And here you can see the pulmonary valve insufficiency. So for this patient, um, due to concern of worsening circular shunt, the ascites and the umbilical artery dopplers, it was determined that she would be delivered the next day. Um, since the TR cell gradient was 32 millimeters of mercury and our hope was that the pulmonary valve would open, um, no prostaglandins were used for this patient. Um, this patient uh, delivered and her oxygen saturations were 60 to 70 percent. Uh, she was placed on oxygen um, and transferred to the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, um, where a transthoracic echocardiogram showed that the pulmonary valve was opening with decreased velocity across. She, uh, the left ventricle was underfilled, so she was supported with um, epinephrine and dopamine. And by day three of life, she had good velocity across her open pulmonary valve. Um, she was transitioned to sildenafil for afterload reduction and uh, was discharged home on room air 95% and is waiting for um, cone repair timing. And then our last case was a transfer from an outside hospital. Um, this fetus had normal anterograde flow through the pulmonary valve. And then right before they came to us at 34 weeks, the study showed pulmonary atresia, no pulmonary valve insufficiency. So as we talked about, things change. At 36 weeks of gestation, there was still pulmonary atresia, but now there is moderate pulmonary valve insufficiency. Um, and retrograde flow through the ductus arteriosus. The tricuspid valve systolic gradient was 28, so borderline, but still on the higher um, on the higher end. So as you can see here, there's a dilated right atrium and the significant tethering of the septal and anterior leaflets. You can see the severe tricuspid valve insufficiency going all the way to the top of the right atrium and the pulmonary valve. So pulmonary valve here not much leaflet movement, and you can see the pulmonary valve insufficiency and the retrograde flow through the ductus arteriosus.
So delivered at a tertiary center, um, this patient actually after, um, after us seeing her in MFM, she was admitted overnight just for monitoring, noted to be an early labor and since it was her seventh pregnancy, um, she underwent induction. Um, since the tricuspid valve systolic gradient was 28 um, and is borderline, the decision was no prostaglandins, um, and then we would tolerate SATs uh, greater than 70%. Patient was delivered, SATs were 75 to 80%. Um, he was placed on 100% uh, nasal cannula and transferred to the cardiac ICU. Um, Unfortunately, the infant saturations could not stay above 75% without the patent ductus arteriosus open, so underwent a PDA stent at day 10 of life um, to support their oxygen saturations 92% or, or greater, and um, just recently underwent a cone procedure. Thank you, everyone, for your time. All right, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Next up, we have Dr. Justin Ye. Um, he's gonna discuss neonatal Epstein's care in the CICU. Dr. Ye joined us in 2018, and he's the Associate Professor of Critical Care Medicine and Pediatrics, as well as our Chief of the Cardiac ICU and Co-Director of the Heart Institute here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Dr. Villegas, for that kind introduction. I will be speaking to you today about neonatal Epstein's care in the cardiac ICU. I have no disclosures. Our objectives for today will be to take that excellent discussion that Dr. Johnson just had about fetal risk stratification and try to talk about how that informs how we prepare for these infants in the cardiac ICU. We'll talk about Epstein's postnatal physiology and its impact on our care in the cardiac ICU. Then we'll review uh, what we've come up with here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh as our neonatal treatment algorithm for Epstein's anomaly. And finally, we'll segue that into a discussion of post-operative management. As has been discussed already, we know that Epstein's anomaly is a lesion with variable presentations, which is really secondary to variability in the underlying anatomic substrate. Neonatal presentation usually connotes more severe disease Yet there's still really a spectrum of patient presentations and outcomes, and that was clearly illustrated in Dr. Johnson's discussion. I'll take you back to that study that she alluded to by Freud et al. from 2015. This was a retrospective multicenter trial, which looked at uh, a compilation of fetal echoes to try to identify risk factors for perinatal mortality. If you remember from Dr. Johnson's discussion, they had reported a perinatal mortality of 45% in this patient population. Several factors came out in their multivariate analysis, which have already been discussed, but were uh, in review, the gestational age of diagnosis less than 32 weeks, which essentially meant that the children's, the fetus's heart was quite enlarged and was picked up earlier during their um, fetal evaluation. Tricuspid valve annulus diameter Z score uh, was also noted to be significant in the multivariate analysis. The presence of pulmonary regurgitation was also noted to be a significant risk factor and clearly could be a potential harbinger of developing a circular shunt physiology. And then last, the presence of a pericardial infusion, which likely indicates the presence of uh, right heart failure and could be a precursor to the development of high drops. Dr. Johnson did a nice job delineating how we um, establish uh, a risk stratification system for evaluation of our uh, fetuses with Epstein's anomaly. And if you'll remember, the, the essential criteria was determining whether or not there's antegrade pulmonary blood flow, blood flow at all. So that was in the category one. If present, those are typically less, less at risk patients. Patients who don't have evidence of antegrade pulmonary blood flow in utero. Uh, we typically use a strategy of identifying whether or not there's the presence of associated pulmonary regurgitation as well as assessing the ability of the right ventricle to develop an adequate um, systolic pressure um, head. 
Now, I don't uh, have the excellent accent or the gravitas of Dr. Anderson, but I'll take you back to the anatomy, if, if only to leave that as an entree into discussion of the physiology of this lesion. Um, as you'll remember, there's significant uh, abnormalities in the tricuspid valve, which leave patients with a combination of regurgitation through that valve, as well as in more severe variants, obstruction to anagrade pulmonary blood flow. There's also typically the presence of an atrial septal defect with right to left shunning at the level of that lesion, which uh, also uh, connotes a degree of cyanosis. This is uh, not untypical x-ray of a patient with Epstein's anomaly, and you can see that there's significant cardiomegaly uh, with likely associated compression of the, of the um, nearby lung structures. Uh, infants, neonates with Epstein's anomaly will typically have a, a kind of triad of presentations, which include cyanosis, congestive heart failure, and abnormal cardiopulmonary interactions. One of the important things we do in the cardiac ICU and, and an idea that we try to um, instill in our trainees' uh, heads as they're, as they're trying to figure out how to manage these patients and all of our patients in the cardiac ICU is it's, it's important to not only understand the anatomy, but how does that anatomy inform the patient's physiology? So in our more severe anatomic variants of Epstein's, these involve severe tricuspid regurgitation, cardiac dilatation, and reduced or non-existent anagrade pulmonary blood flow. Progressive right heart dilatation leads to deleterious interventricular interactions and impairs cardiac output. Um, I'll ask you to think back to those excellent images that Dr. Christopher had on the cardiac MRI, which showed dilated right heart structures that then led to a secondary shift in the uh, ventricular septum. This impairs left ventricular filling and leads to uh, decremental decline in left ventricular systemic output. Progressive cardiac enlargement also restricts lung inflation and leads to derangements in gas exchange. So we have patients with a combination of right heart failure, uh, perhaps some degree of left ventricular dysfunction secondary to poor interventricular interactions, lung compression, and cyanosis. So what are the guiding principles that we use to lead our management in the cardiac ICU? Our first principle is to ensure that there's pulmonary blood flow. So if possible, we try to encourage anagrade pulmonary blood flow by reducing pulmonary vascular resistance. We support ventricular function, frequently the right ventricle, but that may also include left ventricular support. And we support gas exchange while recognizing the deleterious effects of positive pressure and RV mechanics. Um, if you'll remember back to your physiology classes in medical school, you'll remember that uh, positive pressure ventilation is, is um, salutary for reduction in LV afterload, but does increase RV afterload. This is an algorithm uh, that is from one of the more recent papers from our uh, De Silva team. And I think it's helpful to kind of illustrate the general principles for how we approach our neonates with Epstein's anomaly. There will be a subset of patients that are more hemodynamically stable and really as Dr. Johnson was alluding to in her discussion, medical management is focused on minimizing pulmonary vascular resistance, encouraging anagrade pulmonary blood flow and uh, trying to put the patients in a, in a setup where they can be medically managed and defer intervention until they reach an older age at which we're most likely going to have a very successful cone repair. We also have a subset of patients that are much more complex to manage, which include either functional pulmonary atresia, anatomic pulmonary atresia, or the presence of a circular shunt. We'll go through the details of this management further in the later parts of this discussion. So oxygen and additional pulmonary vasodilator therapy in the form of nitric oxide as needed is used to encourage anagrade pulmonary blood flow. We make careful assessments of whether it's actually helpful to maintain patency of the ductus arteriosus. In some situations, clearly, where there is anatomic pulmonary atresia, maintenance of the ductus arteriosus is absolutely necessary to ensure adequate pulmonary blood flow. But in situations in which there is functional pulmonary atresia, allowing ductal closure to occur can allow the, the PA pressures to drop and encourage 
prograde, fl prograde flow through the pulmonary valve. Inotropy um, is added in as needed to support ventricular function and frequently positive pressure ventilation, particularly in cases where patients have significant cardiomegaly and lung compression is necessary to support gas exchange. A subpopulation of these patients is gonna fall out and fail medical management. And typically this is secondary either to inadequate anti-grade pulmonary blood flow and or ductal dependence. And a subset of these patients will also have decompensated congestive heart failure. This is a, a complicated secondary subgroup. So this can be ranging anywhere from patients who have very severe, uh, in essence, cardiogenic shock in the, in the setting of having a circular shunt to patients who have struggled with right heart failure secondary to their severe TR and uh, for the most part can be medically managed but are not growing and have evidence of failure to thrive. No discussion of Epstein's would be um, comprehensive without discussing arrhythmias. Dr. Aurora already had an excellent discussion of this. I only include um, touching on this topic to say that the presence of atrial arrhythmias, particularly in the higher risk subgroup of patients that already have uh, tenuous circulations can be uh, very dangerous and, and can have devastating consequences. Dr. Johnson in her discussion alluded to a patient that we had who had significant atrial tachycardia and required emergent uh, intervention with ECMO to stabilize that patient before further intervention. In our experience, we found the ventricular arrhythmias to be possible, but much more likely to be present in older patients. I'll take you back to that diagram. This is from a paper by Wald et al. that discussed uh, management of patients with circular shunt physiology. The main take home point from, from this patient population is that essentially blood flow is continuously, for the most part, recirculated through the pulmonary vascular bed. And there is significant systemic steel, which uh, uh, essentially leads to a low cardiac output state. In particular, you can see as you work through your work your way through the diagram, the diagram that there's left to right flow through the duct into the pulmonary vascular bed then further retrograde flow through PR into the right ventricle. TR brings that flow back into the right atrium. Through a right to left shunt, it goes across the ASD out into the left ventricle, back out the aorta, but not primarily into the systemic circulation and just goes through the duct back into the pulmonary vascular bed. You are quite limited from a medical standpoint in managing it. Your primary interventions would be to try to restrict ductal flow either through discontinuation of prostaglandin or through more active means such as introduction of indomethacin. And there's clearly some papers um, which we haven't talked about in this discussion, uh, which have uh, raised the concept of trying to introduce the use of indomethacin during fetal life to try to restrict the duct and reduce the degree of pulmonary regurgitation. From a, a surgical intervention standpoint, uh, interrupting that circular shunt can be done either through ductal ligation or in a more definitive way through MPA ligation to interrupt the flow of that circular shunt. ECMO is certainly uh, an important accessory tool which may be necessary in this, in this situation to support circulation pending surgical intervention. I'd now like to take a minute to review uh, the current algorithm that we've come up with at Children's Hospital for our neonatal Epstein's patient. I'd like to extend a word of thanks to our uh, De Silva team for sharing this slide with me uh, so that I can then share it with you in this discussion. Let's first look on this side of the diagram. So in patients who have adequate anti-grade pulmonary blood flow, our efforts are directed at um, not instituting prostaglandins and then following the patient clinically to see how they perform. So in patients that are able to be medically managed without evidence of significant right heart failure and demonstrate somatic growth, we would prefer in that group to continue the medical management strategy and then plan for a cone at the two to five year age range, essentially in toddler life. For patients who have significant right heart failure in the setting typically of uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation, there are a variety of options available and uh, these will be discussed in the, in, the next, um, in the next talk. But 
could include ductal closure, cone, and selective cases and or starts. In patients who have inadequate forward flow in the form of pulmonary atresia, either functional or anatomic, there are additional pathways. So for patients with functional pulmonary atresia, meaning they have a pulmonary valve that could possibly open, and they have a pulmonary valve annulus, which seems reasonable in size, which for us would be a minimum of a negative two, but greater than a negative two Z-score. We try to wean prostaglandins with the goal of seeing if we can encourage anagrade pulmonary blood flow. We would accept some degree of cyanosis. I wouldn't say no cyanosis, but some degree of cyanosis. Typically, if patients are able to maintain saturations in the 80, 80s, we would consider that adequate um, and uh, would be willing to uh, continue medical management in that group with the hope that they would then continue down the pathway towards uh, deferring surgical intervention to a later age. For patients that have more significant cyanosis, their next step is really determined by the degree of both tricuspid regurgitation and the degree of cardiac dilatation as measured by their cardiothoracic ratio. So for patients with a CTR less than 0.8, those patients can typically be managed by adding in an additional source of pulmonary blood flow either in the in, uh, by means of a blalectalcic shunt or by a ductal stent. For patients that have more severe TR and a significantly large cardiothoracic ratio, meaning greater than 0.85, these patients would then undergo a Starnes procedure. For patients with anatomic pulmonary atresia, they obviously require prostaglandins. And for intervention, they would undergo the same type of kind of intellectual exercise of assessing the degree of tricuspid regurgitation and the degree of cardiac dilation. In regards to post-operative management, obviously inotropes are important to support ventricular function. For patients that have uh, a, a more biventricular type repair, it's important to have judicious use of volume expansion. Uh, with the concept being that you wouldn't want to acutely dilate the right ventricle and put all those nice fresh suture lines at risk. In addition, for patients with biventricular repair, pulmonary vasodilators and vent maneuvers to minimize pulmonary vascular resistance in an effort to reduce RV afterload are very important. Judicious use of sedation to minimize significant perturbations in pulmonary vascular resistance, as well as to reduce systemic afterload uh, can be very helpful. And of course, vigilant monitoring for arrhythmias and prompt management is important. I'll just take a quick second to um, talk briefly about uh, a quality improvement exercise which has been pushed through the Pulmonary Critical Care Consortium. This was called the Cardiac Arrest Prevention Initiative. This is really a simple tool which was used to try to create a shared mental model and increase situational awareness for the ICU team. The concept being that twice a day, we would review patients that are particularly at high risk for potential decompensation and cardiac arrest. The bedside nurse, as well as the ICU team, the respiratory therapist managing that patient and the charge nurse are all present for this discussion in the form of a huddle. We would discuss the potential means by which the patient could decompensate and or suffer a cardiac arrest. We would go over the warning signs for how we would identify that that is to occur. We uh, review preventive measures uh, that can be helpful in reducing uh, patient irritability. We have a quick um, assessment of all resuscitative equipment and make sure that it's uh, close by at the bedside. We talk about vascular access and then we review briefly whether or not the patient's an ECMO candidate and how that cannulation is to occur. Then we go through vital signs and we set actual goal parameters for those vital signs as well as uh, alarm limits for our nursing staff. This is not a tool that we use only for Epstein's but is for our general cardiac ICU patient population. And this has been found to be quite salutary through the um, investigation of the PC Fort network and has been successful in reducing cardiac arrest um, in our overall cardiac ICU population. In summary, the varying spectrum of presentations of physiology for neonatal Epstein's anomaly demand a tailored approach to management. Medical management is certainly possible in a subgroup of patients with mild to more moderate disease burden and can delay surgical intervention. Coordination with our skilled surgical partners is absolutely critical for the management of these patients with severe disease and proactive surgical planning may help to optimize outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention and these are my references.
It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Luciana De Fonseca De Silva, who is a clinical assistant professor here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. She is one of our absolutely excellent pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons here at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh. And her topic of discussion is gonna be surgical treatment in neonatal Epstein's, what is new? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rie, for the introduction. Uh, I have no disclosures. I will talk about the surgical treatment of neonatal Epstein's. But first, I would like to highlight the contributions of the uh, University of Pittsburgh. In the 80s, Dr. Zuber Buehler and Dr. Anderson, they uh, studied anatomical specimens and uh, described very well the, the gistal attachment of uh, the uh, Epstein's anomaly. Earlier on in the 60s, Dr. Benson was uh, doing surgeries using the Hunter and Lille High technique. So uh, Epstein's anomaly is not a new thing for UPMC. And some years ago, uh, thank you Dr. Victor Morel and Dr. Kreutzer for creating the Da Silva Center for Epstein's Anomaly uh, in honor to Dr. Da Silva that was the creator of the CON technique with the goal to improve the treatment of Epstein's anomaly. And one of the challenges for us is the, to improve the treatment of uh, neonatal Epstein's. As previously shown, the, if the, the diagnosis is made in the fetal life, the chance of survival is uh, poor. So, and they have high, high risk if there is no integrated pulmonary flow or depressed LV function. Uh, pulmonary regurgitation is the powerful, most powerful uh, hemodynamic indicator of risk, meaning that there is a circular shunt physiology. So, innovative therapeutic approaches are needed to improve the survival. Uh, as the use of uh, non-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory drugs in the uh, fetal life or early ductal closure in the circular, in the circular shunt and even innovative and prompt surgical management. Uh, the risk for mort mortality under the age of three, three months is, was already explained, and I will call attention for the tetradigital attachment of the anterior superior leaflet, the presence of pulmonary stenosis or atresia, uh, the RV dysplasia, and the LV compressed by the right ventricle. This was well described earlier on. Um, but the late sudden death can still occur in those who survive the fetal uh, life and the new, newborn period. So we need to follow those patients, giving them the best treatment. The surgical results in this uh, population is still not good. So in this study made by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons in uh, nine five centers in US among patients operated between 2010 to 2016, the overall oper operative mortality was 27.4%, no matter what kind of procedure was performed. So uh, the STARS procedure is one of the approaches that can be applied. It was created in 1991 by Dr. Uh, STARS, and it's eff effective as an early palliative treatment in patients with heart failure. Uh, it's adequate for all anatomic types of Epstein's anomaly. And we do in the stance procedure, the exclusion of the left ventricle with a patch uh, with uh, orifice uh, in the middle to exclude the tricuspid valve and the right vent ventricle. So this immediately decompress the left ventricle. The midterm survival in his experience was 81% at 10 years by committing the patients to single ventricle pathway. Uh, 
So what we changed here at UPMC, uh, Dr. Da Silva did a, a, a con after the STARNS procedure. So changing the univentricular heart to a biventricular heart. The, new, the con procedure itself in the neonatal paired can be done in those patients with good right ventricular function and good uh, leaflets. I mean, uh, good uh, focal attachment and uh, not very rotated to the RVOT. Here is a result after six months and 36 months with the patient submitted the con procedure by Dr. Da Silva. But we need to remember that those patients are very small. You can see the hand of the surgeon compared to the size of the heart. The leaflets are very fragile, and we need to mobilize all the leaflets. So, and uh, in, those, in this situation, the focal attachment would be easier to do it. But in this kind of uh, presentation, the linear attachment or very displaced valve, it would not be uh, a good chance to survive during the neonatal period. Uh, our previous experience in Brazil with five newborns was presented in 2014, and we had favorable good uh, results in patients with favorable tricuspid valve anatomy and good right ventricular function. For other patients, we need to, uh, to choose palliative procedures until the age is adequate for the cone. So uh, the radiographic follow-up in one of our patients showed a very good decompression of the ventricle and decreasing of the size of the ventricle, in this case, 17 days in the post-operative period. But again, in patients with good right ventricular function, function and good anatomy. In those patients with very displaced tricuspid valve, like this one here, Dr. Lanford demonstrated earlier on uh, this case, uh, this patient was submitted to a, a BT shunt in another institution. And he came to us later on with severe cyanosis and a poor uh, response to exercise. Uh, we then, in the surgical procedure, what we found was a very uh, displaced tricuspid valve. It was almost impossible to detach the, the leaflets from the, the ventricle. It, it was very, very muscularized, and we could see even the fat in the outside of the ventricle. Uh, it was a very tough case, but at the end, the result was very good with a good uh, left tricuspid valve function and a good uh, uh, RBOT flow. So this is one case. There was another case submitted to the uh, stent in, in the PDA here. Um, in patients, uh, with uh, neonatal Epstein, as Dr. Ye mentioned before, we have clinical treatment to, to offer. And in those very unstable, we need to offer uh, more aggressive treatment. Like in this baby here, that in the first night of life, need to go on ECMO through cervical cannulation. And then uh, next day, Dr. Victor Morel performed the STARNS procedure. Uh, the kid then survived, and after five months, we were able to do the con repair, uh, recovering that patient to a biventricular uh, repair. We published this paper in 2020, and now we have three case after starts doing the con. In that operation, we need to remove the, the patch that was closing the tricuspid valve. So underneath, we can see the leaflets of the tricuspid valve that in this case was displaced to the RVOT. And the, this is the final result of with the con repair. Also, uh, in those patients, there was uh, pulmonary atresia, and then we need to do commissurotomy of the valve and enlargement of the anterior leaflet to be more adequate, uh, to have more adequate forward flow. Uh, 
And uh, here is one case with the newborn with Epstein anomaly, a very displaced valve after STARMS. And the advantage of the STARMS procedure is the decompression of the, the left, uh, the right ventricle. So at some point, we will have a good function that can be measured by the gradient, uh, regurgitant gradient in the orifice and by the quality of uh, beating of the heart. And here, after the con and pulmonary valvoplasty, we can see a good forward flow and a good flow in the pulmonary uh, valve. Uh, in circular shunt, as I said before, we can use uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This was a case done in Brazil. Dr. Uh, Lilian Lopes used uh, non anti-inflammatory drugs to, to do the duct constriction. As we can see here in this curve, that, that kid presented with pleural effusion and ascites. So this was the reason for the, the medical treatment. And after, in the third, four week of life, the baby was born weighing only two kilos. And then the patient was submitted to the stance procedure by Dr. Freire, and then later after, and the pulmonary artery closure. And then later after Dr. Da Silva did the con procedure and pulmonary valvoplasty at five months of life with a, a very good result. Uh, so in our experience, at least here at the UPMC, all the roads lead to Rome. Oh, no, to the con, sorry. <laughs> Uh, um, but uh, Dr. Ye presented very well our, our fluxogram, how to treat those patients. Some of them, they need to do a BT shunt or a PDA stent. Some of them needs to, do, to, to be submitted to the stance procedure or PDA closure. And those with the circular shunt, the stance procedure plus uh, pulmonary artery close. But at the end, everyone can be submit to the con procedure. And sometimes we need to add the bidirectional gland if the RV function is not as good. So in our, uh, in our uh, experience here at the Children's Hospital since 2016, we had 36 patients. Uh, uh, four were submitted to the uh, neonatal uh, uh, procedure and three um, three of them were submitted to the con repair after the stance. One of them is waiting for the, the repair. Uh, the neonatal con, neonatal con repair was done in two patients. And call attention that some of the, those newborns were very sick and three on ECMO before the con or the stance procedure. Uh, one cone re repair was needed in one neonatal cone repair. And uh, the cone repair in adults or uh, later on life, we have done in, in third patients and three after BT shunt. So in summary, um, the clinical and anatomical presentations will define the treatment in neonatal abstinence. The Da Silva cone procedure in neonatal abstinence can be used as the primary biventricular repair in a specific subset of cases after BT shunt or PDA stent after an initial neonatal stance procedure. For critical newborns with the Epstein's anomaly, the staged approach with the start procedure followed by the con procedure is favored over primary to, to ventricular repair. As I said before, this was an innovation of uh, uh, Dr. De Silva done here at Pittsburgh and uh, with the con after the stance. And a prompt medical attention with ECMO and early intervention is advisable in critical neonatal Epstein. And this is very well done for our um, multi, uh, multi uh, professional team. Thank you so much. <laughs>
All right, thank you everyone. Back to our discussion. So we'll start off with Dr. Ye. First question is, what is the management strategy in neonatal Epstein's with functional pulmonary atresia? Uh, I could pull up your slide if you yeah, like. Sure. <laughs> That's a good question. So with functional pulmonary atresia, the goal is to try to see if we can uh, actually let the duct close, encourage anti-grade pulmonary blood flow. We do that by uh, trying to decrease PVR. So uh, giving supplemental oxygen in some cases nitric oxide as well, and then supporting right ventricular function. Uh, you know, a portion of that decision in, in determining how successful we're gonna be in um, functional pulmonary atresia with achieving integrated pulmonary blood flow is a couple things. So one is the morphology of the, the uh, pulmonary valve annulus and the pulmonary valve itself. The second is how much functional right ventricle we have. And then the third is what kind of pressure head can the RV generate as measured by the tricuspid regurgitation. The next question, I think the answer was alluded to by both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Defonseca, but would you consider treating the mother with ibuprofen to prevent circular shun in utero and allow for more fetal growth? And what is the criteria for choosing those patients? So for those patients, I think a lot of it depends on their gestational age and when we would consider um, endomethacin or ibuprofen uh, therapy. And just, um, you know, as you can see, some of the papers, the most recent paper published in 2021 sort of looked at a, their uh, cohort, I think of 12 or 15 patients, their mean age was 30, so that they treated. So anywhere from 20 to 34. So I think it's really just the age of the patient and what else is going on um, for that patient to consider uh, ibuprofen or endomethacin. Yes, uh, especially in those presenting with the high drops and uh, uh, pleural effusion, we, we should consider it. And we need to, to have those patients being born as mature as possible. So if we, we, the patient is not doing well in the uterus, we need to use it. And we need to be prepared to, for those patients to be born in a place where they can go to the surgery immediately because they can need like the ligation of the PDA immediately after. Or like in that case that I presented, the patient was in a bad poor condition with two kilos, and then he need to be treated with immediately going on cardiopulmonary bypass and doing the STARS procedure. So those patients, uh, we need to have a, a very good multi-professional team working together to prevent the deaths. Excellent, and that answer touched on the next question too, so we'll move on. Um, so what is the optimal CVP after cone procedure? <laughs> yeah, the optimal CVP is a normal CVP. So. <laughs> <laughs> because what we expect after the cone, a normal function of the ventricle and a normal tricuspid valve. Of course, there are patients that we have some dysfunction. So in those patients, I go into the side of Dr. Ye, we need to decrease the, the, um, the pulmonar artery pressure and resistance with some drugs. Dr. Ye? Yeah, I would say to supplement uh, Dr. De Silva's discussion, <clears throat> I wouldn't truly use one number as a definition of how successful we're being in the post-operative period. Um, you know, there's typically fluctuations in the CVP. If we're seeing persistent elevated double digit CVP, that's usually more concerning. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to look at how the patient's doing clinically as a whole. So if there's other markers of good clinical cardiac out output, any one individual CVP measurement becomes less concerning. Okay. And then back to Dr. Johnson. So in the first case that you had presented, um, the echo to our to the person asking the question, they felt like it looked like tricuspid valve dysplasia um, and the annulus appeared to be closer to its anatomic place. Um, they were just like a comment, that's all. Yeah, I think um, when the patient delivered, sometimes in fetal you see a, most, a more posterior angle 
Um, so therefore it looks like tricuspid dysplasia. The same goes for the patient in the third case. On fetal, you saw more of the uh, septal and inferior leaflets, so it did look like tricuspid dysplasia. This is the constant battle in our department in the echo lab, deciding is it tricuspid dysplasia or Epstein's. Um, so I think sometimes fetally it looks more like tricuspid dysplasia, but then when you see it as a transthoracic, you see more of that anterior leaflet. So yes, I, I could see the first case being a discussion in our lab, is this tricuspid dysplasia or Epstein's. All right, and that closes our discussion. Thank you. All right, our next family video is um, the Jocelyn and Megan Troglin family. And I first met um, Jocelyn and Megan when I was pre-oping Jocelyn for her cone procedure. And mom mentioned to me that they would be back in six months for her to have her cone procedure. So this is a little video that outlines their journey um, as a mom and daughter having their cone here in Pittsburgh. Dr. De Silva was definitely down to earth and definitely made it a lot easier um, to prepare for the surgery. You know, we had so many questions and he was able to answer all of them and he felt confident that the surgeries would go well. I will never forget walking down the hallway carrying Jocelyn to lay her down on the operating table. Uh, me and the nurses started singing Girl on Fire to her, which was her favorite song. As the anesthesia was administered and her eyes rolled into the back of her head. It was a very scary three hours waiting um, in the waiting room for the nurses to come and tell us all of the updates. Not knowing if she was going to survive. Um, you know, just praying a lot. Being with my family and hoping everything went smoothly. When Dr. De Silva walked through the double doors to the waiting room after her surgery, I couldn't breathe. It was such a surreal moment, you know, just waiting. When he came up to me, he had the biggest smile on his face. And he told me that everything went perfectly, that she's a fighter, and that her heart was stabilized. The cone procedure took, and she was doing okay. I will never, ever forget that moment. Three days after Jocelyn's surgery, she actually did a cartwheel um, after she was taken off all of her IVs in her room. She was so excited we had to calm her down so she didn't hurt herself. Three months later, I followed in Jocelyn's footsteps to have my surgery done. After going through the experience with Jocelyn and Dr. De Silva, I was confident that everything was going to go smoothly. Recovery was a little bit more difficult than Jocelyn's. I think, you know, her being younger, everything was a little bit easier for her, and kids bounce right back. Um, it was a little bit of a progress for me, but after cardiac rehab and just getting to fully embrace my heart, I was able to drop a lot of weight, you know, walk down a hallway without being out of breath, things I had never done before. I will forever be indebted to the team at UPMC, to Glenda for helping us along the way, to the nurses who took care of us, and to Dr. De Silva for giving us a new lease on life. Hi, I'm Jocelyn, and I'm five years old, and I love unicorns, and also I love my mom. What are some things you like to do? Well, I, I like to paint, and I also like to draw. And what did Dr. De Silva do for you? He um did heart surgery. And what did mean you have in common? At strings and nobody. <laughs> Sorry. Are you happy? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're down to our uh, last presenter before we have a final discussion with uh, Jose Pedro. Uh, and uh, this will be Rudinger Lang, who is the director of the Clinic for Cardiac and Vascular Surgery at the German Heart Institute in Munich, Germany. Uh, 
And I know that, that Jose Pedro and Rudiger are good friends and they collaborated throughout the years. And I know that, that uh, in Munich, uh, where he works, uh, it's, it has a long history in the management of uh, Epstein's anomaly, and uh, they're really interested in the surgical treatment of it. And uh, we're looking forward to his talk on the outcomes of the cone procedure. Thank you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation and for the privilege to present our Da Silva Cone procedure data from the German Heart Center in Munich at this wonderful meeting. In the last 40 years, there have been different surgeries for Epstein malformation at the German Heart Center Munich. Altogether, we up to 2016, we had 195 cases and 88% of those cases received a repair. There were different repair techniques like uh, the hardy plastic, monocast valve, other repair techniques, and only recently the cone procedure. We even developed uh, our own technique, the Sebening stitch. Professor Sebening, my predecessor at the German Heart Center, developed this technique in, in the 1970s. And it was basically a technique to create a monocusp valve out of the Epstein malformation by pulling the anterior leaflet towards the native valve ring. And this is shown in this historical video. Here you see the posterior leaflet, multiple tethering, there's a gap in the posterior leaflet, a gap between the anterior and the posterior leaflet, which is closed here. Another perforation in the posterior leaflet. So all the gaps and perforations were closed to create one single plane as the new monocast leaflet. And then after this plane had been created, the papillary muscle of the anterior leaflet was identified, a plateau suture was attached, and the monocusp leaflet was uh, pulled down to the, to the septum of uh, the right ventricle. And then a uh, plagiated Diviga kind plasty was used to reduce the ring. Now, as you all know, the results of these, all these techniques were never sufficient. Here we looked at the 25 years of different repair techniques, excluding the cone technique, and it shows very nicely that at 25 years, 73% of the patient had developed more than moderate TI, 51% even more than severe TI, and the rate of reoperations after 25 years with different repair techniques was 43%. So we had the great privilege to be invited by Professor Da Silva and his wonderful wife Luciana Fonseca to Sao Paulo in September 2009. I was accompanied by my dear colleague, Professor Christian Schreiber, who unfortunately deceased. And we both wanted to learn this technique and we received the first steps uh, in Sao Paulo. After this, uh, Professor Da Silva and Luciana came to Germany several times and we did the first operations together and developed the technique for our center. It took me some time to understand why the cone procedure was the preferred technique for the Epstein malformation. If you look at this three-dimensional model of a uh, right ventricle, you see this inward replacement of the posterior leaflet and the septal leaflet deep down into the 
the right ventricle towards the apex of the right ventricle. So if you want to repair this valve with all three leaflets, anterior, posterior and septal, you cannot do it in a plain fashion like the other valves, but you have to create something that goes into the ventricle like a cone. This is an example of surgery at the German Heart Center of a severe Epstein disease. As you see here, the posterior leaflet, multiple tethering, the displacement of the, the annulus into the ventricle, the attached septal leaflet, and here the anterior leaflet, which is usually uh, free for repair. So we developed our own procedure in so far that we follow always the same steps. We cut at the anterior leaflet first, then it's followed by a dissection of the septal leaflet and then dissection of the posterior leaflet all the way down as far as possible into the right ventricle. After this, here you see leaflet, septal and posterior and anterior. And after this, we do uh, the, the ugliest part of the procedure. I call it the ugliest part because you always, during this placation procedure, you're always afraid that you might hit the right coronary artery. Fortunately, it hasn't happened to us yet, but uh, you're, you're always concerned that it might happen. And here, the creation of the cone starts. The septal leaflet and the anterior leaflet are connected by uh, a running suture and what is extremely important for this operation is that all the leaflets are without any tension. If there is only a little bit of tension, one detachment that hasn't been loosened, then the cone cannot work. And here you see then the attachment of the leaflets to the valve ring. The valve ring has been longitudinally plicated before. Now there are some more single plications on the ring to make it fit for the leaflets and then the leaflets are attached to the valve ring. And you see the locked continuous sutures and here is uh, the water test and shows the competent valve which is also shown on the beating heart on echocardiography. You see the cone very nicely uh, compressing and without any insufficiency. Now we looked at several aspects of the cone procedure in our experience. We looked at the cone, how it compared to conventional repair for Epstein anomaly. As you saw already before, here the incidence of moderate, more than moderate TR for other repair techniques compared to the cone operation. Of course, we have to admit that the median follow-up for the cone procedure in this publication was only 3.7 years. The longest was about seven and a half to eight years. But still it shows you that at least in the midterm you have excellent results and almost no residual tricuspid regurgitation with the cone procedure compared to other repair techniques. And the comparison was highly significant. And also for the incidence of reoperation, you see there was no cone procedure which had to have, have a reoperation as opposed to a lot of reoperations with other repair technique, again, highly significant. So the functional results with the cone procedure, at least in the midterm, are excellent. We also looked at the preoperative predictability of right ventricular failure following surgery for Epstein anomaly. The question that we wanted to answer is, is there a patient subpopulation with Epstein disease 
who would benefit more from a quick and straightforward tricuspid valve replacement rather than a cone procedure. So we tried to develop risk criteria which had not been evaluated for uh, Epstein disease and also not for the cone procedure. And we said age more than 40, right ventricular volume index, anti-stolic volume index more than 200 milliliters per square meters and right ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%. So we looked at 68 patients, 40 patients with at least one risk factor, 24 patients with age more than 40 years, 16 patients with decreased right ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40, and 18 patients with right ventricular anti-stolic volume index of more than 200. And this shows you the distribution of those 40 patients in the different risk groups. And in the center you see three patients who had all three risk factors. And if you look at mortality, all three patients who had all three risk factors died. So age, decreased right ventricular function and a large dilated right ventricle has to be considered and are considered to be preoperative warning signs for complicated post-operative course. So before planning to do a cone procedure, these risk factors should be evaluated and eventually uh, the procedure should be switched to a, a quick valve replacement. And then we also look at cone repair for Epstein's anomaly and its effect on right ventricular size and function. This was an MRI study we did early after our initial experience. And you see here very nicely on the left panel, you see the huge right ventricle with a big atrialized portion without any contractions. And after the opera cone operation on the right panel, you see almost, it appears almost like a normal physiology after the operation. Here again, you see the small contracting part before the Epstein repair and the huge atrialized portion of the right ventricle and on the right side, almost physiologic appearance of the right ventricle. So of course, we found that the right ventricular ejection fraction decreased after cone and after the plication. Now why? Because the regurgitant volume was not there anymore uh, because the valve was competent and also the, because the ventricle became, had become smaller. But the good news was that not only the right ventricle becomes smaller, but that it also provides more forward flow. On the left panel you see the anti volume of the right ventricle which decreased considerably and significantly and on the right panel you see the integrate net stroke volume index which increased in almost all patients highly significant uh, at 0.035. So what have we learned from our experience of the cone procedure? It is a reliable repair technique with excellent midterm results. Not every patient is eligible for a cone repair. Multiple risk factors have to be considered. Early MRT studies show uh, uh, an improvement of right ventricular function However, the quality of life improvement and the survival benefit, they both are yet to be shown for this procedure. So to, have, to gain more experience and to gather patients from all over Germany and also from Europe, we founded the Epstein Centrum at the German Heart Center three years ago.
and this was a big success because we now have a sufficient caseload for the whole team to be always in practice. And with this I end my presentation but not without to thank Luciana Fonseca and Pedro da Silva for their incredible support. Here you see the two with me during one of the visits in Munich. We have our little kids on our shoulders. They are now much bigger, but the friendship between those two excellent surgeons and the German Heart Center will always stay there. So thank you both for all your support and for everything you have done for the German Heart Center. And I thank you all for your attention and for the privilege to present. Well, that was a wonderful presentation and, and uh, obviously describing the benefits of the cone and, and there are uh, obviously uh, physiological changes associated with the cone that lead to a better outcome and they're measurable. So it's a terrific uh, procedure. Um, we're down to the, to the end of the symposium, guys, and uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes. Uh, um, I, I will just say for me personally, what, what learning the comb procedure from Jose and Luciana, uh, the biggest challenge for me was to realize that you have to take down all those adhesions uh, all the way down to the apex of the heart, and you're going to just leave a few of them. Uh, that seemed a little scary for me at the beginning. And uh, after uh, having the master uh, next to me telling me, go ahead, do it, uh, realized that this is really the only way it works. And, and I think Dr. Lang made a good point. You, there can't be any attachments left for the cone to work well. And, and this is something that, that I think we all, there's, a, there's clearly a learning curve to it, but, but it's quite doable. And uh, Jose, do you, do you want to comment on, on maybe, the, I'm sure there, there's many people in the audience who've uh, never done it or, uh, and, and what would you suggest would be the, the key components of, 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 for a surgeon out there to, to do this procedure? I think you just delineate it. Um, first, you have, uh, of course, to analyze the anatomy and to know what you have to do, because depending on anatomy, you have to do different maneuvers. But at the end, you have to mobilize uh, all the leaflets and uh, uh, extensively. And, and then um, sometimes you have to rotate tissues uh, to, to make to get the height of the the, the, the all leaflet, all the cone areas, and sometimes maybe you need to add some tissue from outside. This has been rare in my experience, but I think it can be very helpful if you are uh, at the beginning to have much experience doing it. Uh, so basically it's that, to, to, because it's not mobile. For example, if you leave something attached to the anterior wall, and to the anterior leaflet that is, is not uh, deep enough, that's not near the apex. Then when the, you fill up the right event, it's kind of pull the, the leaflet uh, laterally. And this creates a great tension in the suture of the cone and it can rupture. And this happened to me. I have to take the patient immediately to the OR. And that was the cause. I didn't take down the leaflet uh, uh, sufficiently to, to do the cone. You know, another another uh, sort of a aha moment that I had in the operating room with you was when we were doing this cone uh, on a patient and uh, the septal leaflet was just a little sliver of tissue that was very apically displaced. And, and I assumed that there was nothing to do with it. We're just going to let it sit there and there's nothing to do with it. And you taught me, you said, dissect, dissect it. And we dissected the leaflet. We, there was no way we can bring it up, you know? So we, we start from the top and mobilize it down. And then we just utilize the septal leaflet, whatever was there as a papillary muscle. 
So when we rotated the, the posterior leaflet, we ended up attaching the posterior leaflet at the apex to the septal leaflet, which basically helped anchor that posterior leaflet to the heart. And that septal leaflet just became a papillary muscle or an attachment for the cone to work. So again, there, there are just many little intricacies to this procedure that as you do the operation, uh, uh, you kind of learn. Uh, but obviously, you know, I, I sit here and now for those of us who do it, it's a very simple, you know, you go like, okay, I say, oh, which why I didn't think of this procedure you know, because it makes sense. As a surgeon, it makes a lot of sense what, why the cone works and how it works. And once you do it, you, you realize, well, this makes a lot of sense. And, and I certainly want to congratulate Jose and, and, and Luciana for all the work you, they've done um, with uh, this procedure and, and, you know, to help manage the Epstein's anomaly, which in my eyes was sort of a horrific uh, problem to have as a, as a patient. And now I can say, you know, it's something that we can solve. Uh, so it's really been transformational uh, what, what uh, Jose uh, came up with. And, and I certainly want to congratulate you. And I want to give you a couple minutes to say uh, a few things, whatever you might want to tell the, the public and, and all the attendees. Uh. Okay, first of all, I have to thank uh, you, Victor Morel, Jack Kreitzer, um, and our, our group of surgeons, uh, uh, cardiac surgeons, um, like Melita, Luciana, uh, Melita Vieiras, Luciana La Fonseca, and, and then Mario that was not here, Mario uh, Castro Medina that uh, has been working while we are here, uh, and he is taking good care of our patient, also did uh, save some patient Epstein the anomaly. Uh, so all the team involved. And also for putting together this uh, meeting, I want to uh, uh, thank to Erin Colvin and Kate Scollin that were essential to, to make it work uh, perfectly. And so at the end, I would like to thank all the, our team uh, of the Heart Institute Children Hospital Pittsburgh, especially those who were presented today. I want us to, to thank the speakers uh, and like I said, and this special to the participation of Dr. Robert Anderson uh, and Rudiger Lang. Dr. Anderson, everybody knows his work in anatomy uh, and, and embryology of the heart uh, with innovative uh, ideas and concepts. Uh, Dr. Lang, he did his presentation. He showed the important work they had done with the Abyssin anomaly and the, the important uh, team in Europe. And also, I want to express my uh, gratitude and, and honor to join the UPMC, an institution that uh, supports uh, innovative initiatives based on science uh, education. And, and also in technology, and also be, uh, without uh, losing the focus of a patient-centered medicine that have helped so many patients with many diseases and also help the family of those patients. So thank you. Well, uh, it's been a real pleasure, um, and I hope uh, that this proved to be uh, educational for uh, the participants. Uh, I have to say, we, we certainly enjoyed this, and, and uh, we're already planning on our next, uh, it'll probably be about six months down the road, and likely it's going to be related to complex transpositions. So I hope that those in the audience will join in again uh, in the future. We'll let you guys know when, when the uh, webinar will occur. Um, again, I want to thank uh, everybody. Uh, uh, Angie, Katie, uh, thanks for your support and, and making this happen. And certainly, we want to say uh, thanks to James uh, Ferris, who, who's, who's made the AV uh, segment of uh, this meeting work for all of us. Without him, this could not happen, certainly. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys uh, have a great weekend and uh, hopefully we'll see you in about six months. Take care.